What up, guys? It's Jimmy here with Tech Talk, and today I have Corey. Well, how are you, bud? Doing well, man. So um, Corey trains with us. He's a blue belt um, here at Tech, and kind of just wanted to get on here and kind of just talk and pick his brain and stuff. I'm gonna start streaming soon, and uh, he's a he's really good with computers and he games on computers and stuff like that. Uh, we'll probably get into some jujitsu and and stuff like that too. Maybe. Yeah, man, we're we're, we're making that uh, transition to Tenth Planet, so I know we'll 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 be bringing that up. It's a yeah. it's definitely a different system. I think the terminology is the only thing that uh that that I kind of wonder about sometimes. Because uh, I think I have to agree with Dan and her. I'm a pretty uh I like to always know what something's called, and when you start calling it something different, I'm over here in the in the back looking around, kind of silly. But uh, I think I think the transitions is not that hard. I mean, when you start kind of like one to oneing, why they've called something, you know. So um, I actually had that same uh, thought process, and I asked. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and one thing is, is like when you come up with a move, mm -hmm. like even white belts, blue belts, mm -hmm. if somebody does something and it works, Eddie adds, adds it. Eddie adds it to the system. It's meritocracy. It, yeah, it doesn't matter who, whether it was a black belt, mm -hmm. a blue belt, purple belt. They play with it, see if there's success. If there's success, they um, add it to the system. And, like, and usually that they, they comes up with, like, a, a name for it or whatever. Like, this one was used in New York, New Jersey, or, mm -hmm. like, I'm, I'm obviously I'm just. Generalizing. Generalizing. I don't, I don't know that that come from New York and New Jersey, but. Mm. Those are the styles, mm -hmm. and, that, and that's kind of how they name. Um, and I never really grasped it until I went to Costa Rica. And uh, he was like, zombie. Zombie out, like zombie. And I was like, hey, what are you telling me to do right now? And he was like, dude, like a zombie coming from the grave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, now I, I'll never forget it. So when I'm pummeling or mm -hmm. moving – I'll, when I reach, I'm like zombie. So it made it made sense, but um, r like really, some of the names and stuff, I'm just like, okay, um, you, you like twister side, reverse scarf. Like, right, right. Can we call it reverse scarf? Like, um, it's twister side. We'll, we'll call it twister side if that's what they want to do. But mm -hmm. to me, like, as long as I've been training, I, I, if I say reverse scarf, most people that's trained any length of time knows what it's called. I always wondered, I thought maybe they should, uh, maybe they should have only named the new stuff, you know. Um, you know, because I felt like anything attached to rubber guard, it's like, yeah, make your name for it. I mean, you invented this system from the ground up. I mean, hey, you know, hands off, really, you know. Um, I mean, some of the other stuff, but once again, it's just, it's just another system, you know. I mean, it's not like not knowing the name's not gonna is gonna make you suck at the move. You know, if the move works, the move works. So you know. Well, um, one thing I do like about it, and this is what kind of sold me, and I I feel this way. Like one thing that I really like is that if you're not like in the tenth planet system, like deep into the tenth planet system, when I'm telling you to do something. Oh yeah. And no one, everybody else knows this as reverse scarf. Mm -hmm. If I'm going twister side, twister side, sure. the other guy don't know what the hell I'm telling you to do. I and I like that. Danaher does the same thing with, uh, you know, using Japanese words. Um, not, not as many folks, you know, know the jiu-jitsu moves as the old Japanese uh, words. So, once again, I think it's, as far as, like, in competition and strategy, it makes a lot of sense, you know. Um, you should almost be speaking – that's why, you know, you, you see the Brazilians when they come, they'll be speaking Brazilian in any kind of American competition. They don't care. And unless you speak Brazilian, I mean, you're not understanding what the other coach is. I mean, it's, it is strategy, and I think it, it is pretty important. So, I mean, I, I'd be, I, I definitely understand that. Um, and like I said, overall, I mean, I just – I think the 10th Planet system is awesome as far as, like, they just love what works, man. It doesn't matter if – it doesn't matter where you pulled it from. They're, they have no misconceptions about like, oh, man, hey, you know, we shouldn't touch the legs. And like, hey, do people tap when you touch the legs? Run it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think that's one of, you know, there's less traditionalism and a lot more freedom, which, you know, 
I think on people who actually like to be inventive with jujitsu instead of being like, hey, I'm going to just drill the same thing 10,000 times, you know, I, I, th- I think the 10th planet is definitely good for that, you know, because you can definitely see the schools that hold way too much to traditionalism and they really can, they, they get left behind. Um, I mean, and eventually it, there does become a breaking point, but, you know, I, mean, I don't see the point in fighting it, you know. Yeah, I, I don't either. Uh, that's I think that's why a lot of people like – cross training with our, our school sure because like no no school like no straight pure jiu-jitsu school was wrestling Mm-mm. and when we'd go to competitions they'll say man you guys is pressure man you guys is pressure man you guys is pressure and people started traveling to to learn that pressure that we that we have here and a lot of it derived from wrestling and mma mma wrestling you know so um uh, and it I've never been a uh, like I was in Taekwondo and stuff, but I've never been a, like a traditionalist in mm-hmm. jujitsu. The only thing I've ever incorporated was yes sir or no sir and bow before you get on and off the mat. And Steven's like, dude, stop that. <laughs> and I'm like, no, because it's teaching respect for my school. Sure. And, and so I like people. If people just come in like re- like straight wrestling, pure wrestlers. Um, I love wrestlers. Don't don't get that twisted. But wrestlers have this arrogance about them, like it's all about them, I mm-hmm. guess. And you'll see them when they lose, like they'll they'll just throw the thing that they had wrapped around their ankle, just throw it down on the ground. Or and I get it, they put their heart into this. Mm-hmm. I get it that they they just tried something really hard and they lost or whatever, you know. But I feel like there should be that respect like okay i got a chance to come here and try to wrestle against this guy Uh, he deserves me to shake his hand he deserves me to you know show him respect because he wanted to win just as bad as i did or or whatever and i think that that bowing on the mat and stuff that kind of says okay this is a place i have to show this certain level of respect respect to the mat yeah and just for the place Mm -hmm. because it cost a ton of money to keep a place clean to keep mats and stuff sanitized to to have nice have a nice gym Mm -hmm. it costs a ton of money i'm sure and i don't think people really realize like how much goes into it hey man it's just a mat it's like uh you you weren't there for any of the construction of it or how much this mat costs per square foot and i mean you know and i mean just how much blood sweat and tears goes into it you know i mean I, I I think I think the respect thing has never been a problem for me, and I think I think especially for like the kids program or something. It's I mean you you see the change in the kids, you know, and I and that might not necessarily be like hey oh traditional martial arts things. Like also could be a little bit of the southern thing too, you know. I mean the, your your gym is in the south, you know, so I mean it's just a little little bit higher level of respect. And I don't think there's anything wrong for that because it shows you it's like hey man you step on the mat you know you can get a respect respect as an equal just for stepping on the mat with us you know yeah and i think it shows like a, a level of it, it should be like kind of inviting to people you know it's like hey you know we're all showing respect here it doesn't matter what what level you're at doesn't matter if your kid doesn't matter you know we're gonna we're gonna show the kids the same level of respect we're gonna show any adult that steps on the mat you know yeah. um and, and and you know it is a part of the gym culture you know so i, I wouldn't get rid of it you know and I mean, but you don't, and you you might not see that level of camaraderie either that we see in the gym without it, I don't feel. You know what I'm saying? I know exactly what you're saying, and I I get it. Like, Mm -hmm. that's that's one of the things that I kind of feel like, hey, we need more of at other other places. Sure. Um, And talking about people not understanding, like, the cost of things and stuff, uh, I was on... Uh, the swapping shop, Facebook swapping shop the other day. And one of my buddies that actually helped me uh, set this podcast up, mm-hmm. his name's David. Um, he goes and picks up plywood. That's his business. He picks up plywood from like these uh, trailer plants and these cargo plants and things like that. He brings it back. He builds pallets and like heat treats these pallets. And what he don't use, he stacks back up on another pallet and then he sells the the scrap wood to mm-hmm. people that may need like a three by four sheet of plywood like a yeah. three foot by four foot sheet sheet of plywood's forty dollars right 
he's selling at like three dollars a sheet for a half a sheet. Right. And um, but he's storing it in his warehouse. He spent his gas to go find it. There was a guy like clowning like. You got that for free, and you're trying to rob people. I hope it rots. And he was just being a straight, yeah. He Uh, went in on my friend, and I personally, I was like, I want to beat this guy up. (laughs) And obviously, I can't go beat the guy up, but I was like, did you use your gas? Did you use your building? Did you use your time to go and get this? Uh, plywood because he's he was his big thing was oh you got it for free and now you're trying to charge people for it like dude I don't have time to go to a trailer plant wait on them to tell me that I can get it then I don't have the equipment to load it up haul it off move it anywhere storage storage I don't have any of that but this room that we're in this ceiling like that like that it was built with this stuff. And I got on this tangent just now because we were talking about the mats being clean and, like, the, the cost that goes into things. People do – they just don't get it when it's not their money. Or their time. Or their time. And my time is more valuable than money to me. By far. By far. So, um, anyway, like, I, I wish people could grasp, like, any business, anything that you're doing – Like, when you're spending a ton of time or a ton of energy, like, that thing deserves your respect. Sure. And that's what I try to teach to the kids to bring everything and tie everything together. My brain goes, whoop, squirrel. Mm -hmm. But, like, it deserves a certain type of respect. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a lost uh, thing in our society right now is, like, everything's right now at your fingertips. Like, knowledge. Uh, I want to learn how to paint something. I can Google it, YouTube it. I want to learn how to fly an RC plane or something. I could Google that. I could YouTube it and find it. It's instant. It's instant gratification. The kids in the younger generation right now haven't had to sweat. They haven't had to... uh, Some of them have, but they haven't had to... like put in the work that David was putting in to go get that plywood, to go set it up, to use it to, or to do things, or my mat, set them up and spend the money that I spend monthly. And I don't think they value it as much. And that's why teaching them the respect or the those things is so important. Like, hey, you respect this because it, somebody worked really, really hard to be able to provide this service or provide this for you. So what I think, I think... Social media has a lot to do with that. So you got to think of what they're seeing. The only thing they're ever seeing and the only thing that's ever showed, especially on social media, is the finished product. It doesn't matter whether it's exercise program or it's, you know, something that somebody's put, you know, 10 million hours in. They might, it might be a 30-second video. You know what I mean? They're never really I – think, I think there's a lost – appreciation for process you know and 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 really you know the instant gratification is once again it's like hey you know i I put i put a i put a social media post up and it got a bunch of likes and i felt good right i that's instant i i didn't how much did i have to work for that post really did you did you really you know and and you're you're structuring your brain to value short term you know just very very instant kind of you know gratification like you were saying and you know why would you respect something that somebody put a lot of time in when you, when, you know, the only thing that makes you feel good is the short term stuff. And I, and I don't think it's very healthy. You know, that's why, I mean, my, myself personally, I don't, I don't like how children have social media and stuff like that. Um, I, I think, you know, it, it should be much later in their development, you know, and it's, it's hard for me to want to blame the younger generation for when, you know, what we do is we put this stuff in their hands and put this, thing that it I mean we we've shown we've known there's there's a great book called Coddling the American Mind uh that I would suggest for anybody to read um where he talks about the effects that and, and some people can say oh it just makes kids lazy no there are some actual serious dire side effects you know but that's why in my opinion I love programs like the kids program here because it is the it is the antidote to that short term mindset because there is nothing in jiu-jitsu that's short-term. 
There's nothing that in jiu-jitsu that rewards you for being short-term minded. If I'm rolling with you and you're short-term minded, I'm going to win. Easy. If, if the only thing you're thinking about is one, is one arm in jiu-jitsu, then you're ignoring the rest of the body. I, I mean, jiu-jitsu teaches you to look at the long game. It teaches you, hey, man, I'm going to train and I'm going to be out here with these folks, you know, putting my blood and sweat and tears on the mat, and I might get crushed for four years. And then eventually I'm, I can give some of that back, you know. But I think – you know, the process and, like I said, the long-term mindset that it engenders, especially for kids, is like, you know, I have my own kids in the program. And, you know, some of the, some of the benefits is when we're coming, when we're coming uh, consistently to classes, I mean, they're different children, man. You know, they're, they're so, much, uh, so much more respectful. They're so much uh, calmer. You know, they, they seem to be a little bit more thoughtful about everything, you know. And, I mean, it's, it's – then you contrast it to being out and giving them – you know, tons of freedom to just, I mean, I love video games, man, but I do think that, you know, all, always any, everything has to be in moderation and stuff, you know, give, give them, give them video games for 24 seven and see how, see how that, see how that works for the kids, you know? Yeah. Dude. Um, <clears throat> something you were saying earlier is like had the, the side effects from, um, I was watching a, a guy named Simon. Uh, can't think of his last name right now, but he was talking about, it's dopamine. It's the same when somebody messages you or likes your picture or whatever, the, the kid is feeling dopamine, which is the same thing that keeps you addicted to most drugs. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so it's so addictive just having someone like your picture or having someone comment. or That's what's causing us to be addicted to our phones. You're constantly checking it. I ask everybody that come on the podcast, like, hey, man, Turn your sound off. Set your phone down over there. Like, it's one of those things, like, you're like, I don't want you checking your phone, like, and me, like, oh, you know, like, waiting. What are are we doing here? (laughs) Yeah. And, but it's so hard not to pick your phone up and look at it. And uh, I I struggle with it, too, because, like, I, man, I, I absolutely love going down and seeing people comment on our stuff from the gym and seeing... Like, some of the comments are hilarious, like, on our uh, commercials and stuff. And uh, it, they, I, that's, a, that's a, funny, a funny thing. It's like, you have grown people hating on kids. And so, like, we got a kid's commercial. And it's like, uh, it's Ayla. She's young, and she's, like, getting bullied by three kids or whatever. And she blast doubles one of them. Uh, or no, 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 no. She serenagis one of them. And then she blasts doubles another one, and the other one runs. And you got people, like, it's clearly meant for, it's like drama. It's like to, to say, hey, we, we, we offer this. It teaches them how to be confident. It teaches them how to stand tall, speak clearly. And we have people like, oh, that'll never work. This is a fake commercial. Like, no, did you want me to post a video of Ayla, like, beating someone's ass <laughs> for real? And, like, we could teach a kid to do that. Yeah. I mean, like, it, it's so funny. Just, but anyway, I enjoy that. I enjoy finding those comments. Mm-hmm. And I enjoy replying to those comments because I'm like, well, how would you show me? How would you explain what we do here and, and get people interested and make it more real? And then people were like, uh, uh, did, uh, uh, I'm like, exactly. You're just hating on something that somebody else tried to do and, or tried to, to whatever. Like, there's just so many people, so much hate online. It's ridiculous. I think, I think and, it's, I think, uh, I think those are the people with the least amount of, or that might, not the least, but the most amount of free time. Because I feel like if the best thing you had to do today was to go hate, on a random uh, commercial from a, from a you know place that you don't even go to you know I mean it just makes me question like what do you have going on today man how much time do you have because I couldn't imagine myself having that much time in a day you know I mean I, I have kids you know I have a job I want to get some training in at some point and then to think I just need to find this this school probably in a city that I don't live in and just just hate on their commercials like, I mean I'm wondering it's like man I think. I think you need a new hobby. And I mean, I've got a couple to, that I could suggest to you, you know, that might would, might would help, you know, because I, 
it, it, I think it's just a, I think I, those kind of folks are so desperate for reaction that they just will give out the most vitriolic stuff because l- even listen to what you said. You liked finding that comment and responding to that comment. Oh, yeah. How many of the nice comments didn't you respond to? I'll respond to them all. Come on. No, okay, I have let's, to. Let's, okay, but you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. You, which one would you put more attention on? Probably the negative one. And do you think that person on the other end, they know that. So they yeah. know what's going to – I'm just – I'm bored, man. I don't have anything. Let's troll but, this person. Because he's going to react. And, and I think that's, that's something that people need to always be in mind. So just, how can people be so toxic online? They are just so desperate for human interaction. And, and it, even because people think – I mean, I think this is a this is a really good point that you should, especially you know, if you're dealing with children and stuff like that, that a negative response is still feeding into that. Right. And 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 honestly, in a lot of ways, the human brain views negative responses in in a more like it, it seems to search for them almost more. You know, and because I don't know about you, but if you ever want your kid to not do something or, or to you know to do something, you can just tell them not to do it. <laughs> tell them not to do what you want them to do and i bet the first thing they're going to turn around to, you know because it seems to be uh, it's it's a crazy thing but i think it's really floods into our online um i guess uh, meeting area you know i guess is a good way you know it's almost like the new town hall you know because we're not out anymore talking to each other especially in the current climate and especially in the current you know i mean covid just pushed us more into the house but we were already being pushed in the house for the past 20 30 years i right. mean you don't go out and talk and when's the last time you can imagine talking to people on the street? You when's know? the last time you like walked over to your neighbor and asked him for a cup of sugar or like when's the last time you, you knocked on your neighbor's door and said, Hey, uh, you know, we're, we're grilling out your neighbor, not, not your friends, not people, you know, online, not people, uh, not people that you, you interact with daily, like your next door neighbor or like, Hey, your dog got out. I grabbed him for you. Like, let me put a collar on them and, like, put them back on their porch or whatever. When's the last time you've done something like that? People don't do that stuff anymore. I'm actually glad in my neighborhood that is actually, like, the two, the two neighbors I have are awesome neighbors. And um, <laughs> I'll tell you, because, you know, we have a Husky who's an escape artist. If we didn't, <laughs> if we didn't have my neighbors, uh, we'd have been not that the Husky. I can go ahead and tell you that. He, he'd been unmoved off to Egypt or something, you know, because he dips pretty quick. But, you know, I, and maybe it's because we all have children. Um, you know, uh, so, but I, I think I notice, I definitely notice what you're saying on the whole though, because this is the first place I've ever lived in where I've actually wanted to interact with my neighbors at all. You know, and 90% of the other places I was like, nah, dude, <laughs> definitely not. And, you know, it's definitely, we build, we definitely are building walls around ourselves. And, you know, we wonder why we all feel so self-isolated and why mental health has become the number one problem. Yeah, uh, there's there's no other cause of death for anyone in in the age group that's uh, 14 to, you know, late 30s. The the f- first major cause of death is accident. And you know what the number two one is? Probably suicide. It's terrible. It's, it's suicide. And so you can say that the most dangerous thing in our current society is ourselves. Yeah. And, and we're, we're and and we're not designed to be isolated and we're only doing it more and more and more. Yeah, I. I, I was, that's what I was kind of getting at is like, we lived over there where our house burned down mm-hmm. and we knew our neighbor across the road, but she like knocked on our door and was like, Hey, welcome to the neighborhood. All right. And then my dog got out one day and he's a big pit bull. <laughs> he's, you stomp at him, he runs away. Yeah. Scary. She was scared of him. Right. And she still was like, I had to get him. I didn't know how. So she had like this thing, like keeping him away from her, but still holding him still until we got there to get him. And we become friends that way. Mm -hmm. But she is the first neighbor that I have communicated with in 15 years. Like I lived in the same place for almost 10 years. And I do not know a single person in that area. And so... I know, and we live in Georgia where people are like super polite and nice and everybody's a ma'am and a sir and sure. a y'all and, and like it, it, we're still, and we're this nice and we're still like not being neighborly mm-hmm. and 
it's I think it's just worse in bigger cities and and bigger places. And I think that's what's making it easier to be mean to each other, too. Oh, sure. I think that that's, like, a, a side effect of not having a lot of human interaction. It makes you makes it a lot easier to be mean to someone. It's a lot easier to dehumanize uh, everyone else because if, if, you know, I'm just looking at an avatar instead of having to look at your face. Because I... I, I I, I want you to think of how many times somebody has been as foul to you as they have been on the internet to your actual face. Now, I'm, I'm, it's going to be, I look at it as a level of scale. How many times do you think that really, is, really happens? Because, like, there's a lot of things that just keep us from doing that just when we're in, I mean, you know, uh, uh, starting a fight is one of them, you know, but it's not the only one, you know, it's, it's the fact of, like I said, I'm, you know, you might have a Ninja Turtle as an avatar. So I, in my my mind is almost processing that as like I'm not talking to a person I'm talking to a ninja turtle so I don't really care what this ninja turtle thinks I'm gonna just I'm I'm just gonna just go ham on him you know and just completely destroy you know I, I, I'm gonna talk bad about his entire family and just you know wish ill will on his entire like how many times has that really happened in in you know real life it's the minority and the only place I've seen any, anything clear to the level of vitriol is, is in the prison. You know, when I worked in the prison and even still, like, and these are hardcore murderers and, you know, just, you know, rapists and on the whole, just horribly antisocial people. And I see less of this toxic behavior than I do online sometimes. Cause even them sometimes would just wait. You at least wait. You walked away before to say the mean things. You know? Yeah. But you know, and that was just a sheerly adversarial relationship, you know, um, is what they perceived, you know, but, and it's just crazy that that's how we're treating everyone online now. It's, it's sad, I think. And I'll tell you one thing and, and, and let's bring, I would say bring it back to, you know, jujitsu and something that I feel that like jujitsu gives me personally, me and my, especially my family as well. Cause you know, I, I'm the, I'm the first one to tell, you know, the benefits for the family and, and jujitsu, you know, I mean, it, you know, everybody looks crazy at us, you know, because pretty much my whole family does jujitsu, <laughs> me and my wife and, and, and my children, you know, but just the level of connection that you can feel, uh, you know, it, it's just, it's, it's, you can't find it anywhere else anymore. And I would say it's even above any general, you know, interactions that you feel, you know, because it's, we stop talking at some point, we start trying to crush each other into the mat. There's a, it's a, it's a different form of communication, but for some reason, like rolling around and having someone try and choke you for 10 minutes, you feel closer to that person than you did, you know, having two years worth of conversation at anyone else, you know? Yeah, I do. That, that's actually probably what I love about it so much is, most of the people on that mat have the ability to kill you or murder you or whatever you want to call it. Like, and there's some of the nicest people in the world. And, and obviously we all are trying to win. Uh, we're not trying to win training, but we're, we're trying to do like impose our will sure. while we're on the mat or whatever. But as soon as the, the, the bell goes off or as soon as somebody taps, it's like, oh, man, yeah, I was trying to invert or I was trying to isolate that arm, but you did a good job of <laughs> spinning your arm. Like, oh, man, I, I got so heavy, and you just moved. Like, what did you do? And now you're having this conversation about, like, where you went wrong or they went right or, or you went right and they went wrong. and But, like, it, it's fun and you you have this level this connection with this person that that you just will not ever experience anywhere else with anything else i i, I don't believe and and i think i will say something important that yeah maybe in the current climate you know I'm, I'm not willing to go too much into you know current political climate stuff like that you know uh but you know it just seems like we separate ourselves up groups so much but i'll tell you one thing it doesn't matter i don't care what color your skin is what group you belong to ever you get on that mat with me and put in some work with me and, and, and consistently i mean you're my family and and you're my brother and sister on the mat and i'll feel and you know i mean it it doesn't matter where you come from it doesn't matter you know i mean because once you get on that mat we're going to see who you really are and you're going to come in here and you're going to earn the respect of a group of people and you'll find love and respect on the mat in such a way that, you know, you just won't find it anywhere else. And like I said, your group does not matter. It doesn't matter. Left wing, right wing. It doesn't matter your size. It doesn't matter how good you are. It's showing up and trying. It's showing up and showing effort. 
if you do that, I I almost guarantee you, like you found your you found your people, yeah. and and that's that's it, and that that's what I love so much about it, and um, I, that's kind of why I'm drawn to Steven so much. Mm-hmm. Is uh Stephen uh, is a tenth planet black belt under Richie Boogeyman Martinez, mm-hmm. uh Geo, but um, dude, he has been there for me. Ever since the first time I stepped in a, in his gym in Valdosta, he was teaching a class, and he sat down and had that talk with me, and I have been able to talk to him ever since then, whether we were training together or not. Like he's a good dude, and like this, my whole throughout my whole journey, anytime I was struggling or anything like that, he was there, regardless of what else was going on, regardless of whatever, and that's what jujitsu has done for me. You name my top five closest people in the world to me that has that have helped me or to lift me up or grow to where to where I am now. They they all come from mixed martial arts and Brazilian jiu jitsu, like all of them, and it, it's because it, it breeds a certain type of person. Like you strive for better. It, we're not happy getting up doing our nine to five and going home and drinking beer or whatever and just relaxing the rest of the day away. We're not we're not okay with that. We want better. We want to grow. We want to challenge ourselves. We want to push ourselves. If you can do. MMA and make a career out of it. If you can do that, you can do anything in the world. If you can do jujitsu and try to make a career out of that, anything in the world, I don't care what it is, when you you can do it. It takes a certain level of commitment to get to to become not not where you can defend yourself. Because it don't take a lot of commitment. It don't take much to get to where you can defend yourself. But to get to the top to the 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 best like competing and, and winning these world championships. Like dude, if you could do that, there's there's nothing in the world that you can't do, you know? Yeah. Um I think it was interesting to hear um some of your thoughts about, you know, your coach and stuff like that cuz I've mirrored some of the same, you know, about you, you know? Um I mean, I from the minute I stepped into the gym, um you know, I I mean, I've got the feeling of, you know, being a part of the family, you know? Um and I brought my own family here and I, I can't, I mean, you know, I don't, I don't have to sit here and, you know, you know, profligate to everyone, but you know, I mean, how many times have I told you what this, what this, this gym means to me and my family, you know, just me personally, one to one to you, you know? Yeah. I mean, I've, I've, you know, we, we've definitely, I, I've definitely enjoyed every moment here. And, you know, I think that, you know, like you said, you know, I mean, I've talked to you about a bunch of stuff, you know, I mean, I've, I've definitely, thought that you know that this place i mean it, it, and just just it in general you know just the culture the the way you like to you know the way you like to interact with everyone that's that's here you know i think is definitely something that i mean if you're not if you're not if you're not you haven't experienced it i mean you know you should definitely give it you know definitely give it a try and i mean you know any gym is you know always good you know but you know i, I haven't been to a I mean, I've been to some other jiu-jitsu gyms and stuff like that, and, you know, I haven't felt quite the same culture that I have felt here, you know. Um, and maybe that's just because this is the gym that I started at. I can't, you know, I don't want to – but um, it's it's definitely, you know, helped me out in a ton of ways. And, you know, I don't even think that that just – I think just doing jiu-jitsu has helped me out in, my, in other areas of my life. Like the mindset, I think, is – and I'm not a top-level competitor – I'm not planning on making a career out of it, but I still think that when I run into something hard that jujitsu makes me think is, Hey man, there's a way around this. There's a way over this roadblock. Like, or, or another thought is this pressure is not going to kill me. I think it's like something that I, that jujitsu has really taught me is like when something, you know, because life is going to put pressure on you, man. Life is going to be that, that 300 pound, you know, gold Olympic gold wrestler just crushing you into the dirt, you know, and you're thinking there's no way in the world that I'm going to survive this. And then you realize like, I can, 
I can I can withstand this pressure, and I think that that's something that jujitsu can give anybody. You know, I look at my my oldest daughter. You know, I mean, just from the time she started to now, you know, just look at last competition she had. It was, <laughs> I, I was I, if I would been in that role and in that kind of little <laughs> competition that them two little girls had, I think I would have been upset too. You know, but she she shook it off and got got right back up. And you know, I that mean, was that was amazing. That was such I, a, a, a that was such a great role. And it somebody had to lose, but dang, <laughs> it but dang, been either one, yeah, yeah. but mean, dang, that was so good. And, and like she, she caught herself, and like the way that it turned out though is like she got up, she had tears in her eyes, she wiped it off, went and got some water, and come back. <laughs> and I was just like, I, sort of, I might have spent a little bit more time off the mat than she did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, guess, I guess she's going to be a lot tougher than me. <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, yeah. For me, it was it was an amazing match. And our kids are getting gritty, dude. I'm, I'm loving it. It's great. I mean, you know, and, and just think of what that, what that gives to a kid during life. You know, I'm finding this later in my life, you know, and I'm already can tell, like, I mean, in my professional life and, you know, um, in the way I interact with, you know, my family members, you know, makes you more calm, makes you not want to just, you know, jump all down somebody's throat. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Because you're, it makes you a more even killed person for the various things in life that you're going to face. Dude, uh, you're less likely to jump on someone like or I am now than I was before. Before I was trained, and like I'm, I don't know if I'm more level headed now because of it, or like I, a lot of times it's like, man, I don't know what this guy knows. Like, there's that, there's also that that little bit of doubt in the back of your mind because, like, I've been doing this a long time, and I still run into guys on the mat that I'm like, hmm. I would never want to fight this person <laughs> ever, you know. And uh, there's so many levels to being able to to compete or even like go against someone and there's there's a lot of dudes out there that train everything every day all day and like every bit of free time that they have they're just like i want to get better i want to be the best and and like you run into one of those dudes and you try to pick a fight with them out in the street you don't have a bad day <laughs> Like I said, I mean, I don't, I wouldn't imagine, uh, I, I, I think, I think there's just a calmness that comes. And I think the calmness is something that would preclude you from getting into a fight, you know, because, it, it, you know, I mean, just with the more calm headed mindset, you're just, I'm liable to just be like, hey, say what you want to, bud, I'm just moving on, you know, like, you know, I mean, whatever, you know, like, I think that, and, and I think also there is less fear. And I think one of the main things that people want to say is, you know, like, I, I think I think the the most dangerous per some of the most more dangerous people in the world are people who are terrified because fear is going to make you do something, you know, way out of your character and way out of your league. But if you're not as afraid, you know what I mean. I, I think that's going to keep you out of a fight because, you know, people is oh why do people get shot or something like that? that dude was scared. That dude was terrified. Is why people, oh, dude's just a bad dude. It's like, no, he was scared. He was either scared of how how he's going to be perceived. He was scared of something going to happen to him. You know, his he was his he was scared of his ego being bruised. I mean, because one thing jujitsu will let you know is like, I mean, you can tap, man, <laughs> and you should. <laughs> like, it, it gives you a good ego check too. You know, dude. Um, something that you were saying is like about being scared and and all that. That's my first thing. Like, I'm always, and anytime anything ever happens, like, what, why did you do that? I was scared. Like, <laughs> first, first thing. Why did you slam that guy on the ground? I, I was, was scared. Terrified. I was scared. <laughs> like, that's, no, I was scared. Sure. But uh, there is a certain calmness that comes when you're in that position because I felt it. Um, I've, I've felt it a few times in real life. Um, I started out, uh, with taekwondo tournaments and things and then i went into boxing and then kickboxing i've done some aikido and stuff but like i've done all that stuff and then i come into an mma gym and got the shit beat out of me and i spent like the next couple of days crying about it like i, I literally went home and cried on the end of my bed <laughs> <laughs> because i was a fighter 
And then I realized I didn't know how to really fight. <laughs> but uh, the more you, the more you, you kind of know, like the calmer you are when it happens because you've been there before, if, if that makes any kind of sense at all. 100%. Uh, I think the thing that when I walked into the gym, I'm like, okay, like this dude weighs a buck 40. I'm a, I'm, I, I weigh a good solid 220 coming in, you know, I've been powerlifting and stuff, you know, bigger than I've ever been in my life. And this dude throws me on the ground and puts a knee in my chest and I feel like I'm going to die. And I'm like, okay, um, I don't know what's going on here, but I've been missing something uh, because I'm obviously stronger than him, but I'm not going anywhere. Like until he says it's time for me to get up. <laughs> like, it's like I'm over here just getting the wind, the wind crushed out of me. And I'm just like so confused. And I'm like, okay, there's definitely got to be something to this jujitsu mess, you know, because like, there's, this shouldn't happen. Like, you know, and I mean, I see it all the time, you know, I mean, uh, big dudes will come in and they're like, oh, well, you know, Jimmy weighs, you know, 115 soaking wet, you know, <laughs> but, uh, and, and he's just, just ragdolling them. And, and, you know, I just, it's always the most enjoyable thing for me to watch. I'm like, I'm like, all right. <laughs> he, cause you know, the first thing a big dude does when you go in here, cause you slap bump and he's like, ah, you know, and you're just like, wham. <laughs> it's my favorite. It's probably one of my top, top things that I love seeing in the gym, you know, because you know, then after that, they're just like, Hey man, how, how, how does, how does this stuff work? I mean, there's, there's a couple of reactions. They'll either never come back again ever ever <laughs> like, they're like this is not my ego cannot handle that at all there were other people who seen that travesty you know? <laughs> but, or they'll or they'll be like man i i want to know what's gonna i want to know how to do that you know and i i think it's it's really refreshing to see that you know i love the folks that my people are the people that come back and they're like hey man what's all that about you know i mean th those are my folks you know but yeah that's that's i mean that's the po that's the person you want on the mat with you Dude, um, so I'm um, I'm proud to say this. Like, it's finally sinking in. You remember uh, back when I got my brown? Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, my brown belt. I think you got your blue the same day. Mm -hmm. And um, I was like, oh, I'm a, I'm a brown. But it took, like, three weeks for it to really sink in and me start going, like, yeah, I'm a brown belt. Like, because part of me didn't feel like a brown belt or whatever you know and and then finally i was like oh i'm a i'm a brown belt like it it slowly sunk in like this is real well i'm a 10th planet coach now like i coach at 10th planet perry um i coach wrestling i'm a head wrestling coach over there and uh it's steven's school but i'm a coach there sure and um the other night i was teaching a basically a, a basic snatch single mm -hmm. to a seat belt and there's this kid there. He's probably 21 or 22. He's built just like Mitch, um, like 6'2", probably like 220 pounds. Mm -hmm. And um, I was like, we'll wrestle, you know, because he wanted to wrestle. And I was like just pushing my head into him, like controlling where he was looking and like pinning him to the wall. Took him down, stand up. Took him down, stand up. He freaking threw me. <laughs> he had an army. Boom And we landed I was like oh no I'm getting this back So I stood up again But I was not going hard I was just like pushing him to the wall Doing like I do you know Pushing him to the wall Pushing him to the wall Making him get off And I, I, He threw me down twice The second time he threw me down I just kind of got to guard And clamped up and Went just jiu -jitsu. I went looking around, and everyone else in the entire gym was just, <laughs> nobody was rolling. They were watching us roll, and, like, I didn't know that. And I was just, like, taking him down, cutting him loose, taking him down, cutting him loose. And then, like, he threw me, I took him down, cut him loose. And then he threw me again, and then I was like, oh, everybody's watching. And then I was like, okay, I need to. Like, bring it in a little bit. and I wasn't going hard to begin with. I was going hard enough to make him work. But then I was like, oh, people are watching. I don't want to be a douchebag or whatever, shine on him. I don't want him shining on me either. So, kind of brought it back. But, dude, um, 
everybody kind of stopped and they were watching and uh, we were talking about ego and and all that. I had to like go, oh, okay. I don't want to hurt this guy's ego. I don't want to just smash him out in front of everybody, and I don't want I don't want people to think that my technique don't work either because I'm a coach there or whatever, you know. So I kind of like just toned everything down and went to moving and 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 go on and doing. But then I was talking to Steven later, and he was like, "Dude, like you, it was just the right amount. You didn't go too hard on him. You didn't go." Like, it was just the right amount. And um, he was like, that's why I wanted you in here. He was like, everybody <clears throat> come up to me. He was like, I can't believe, like, Jimmy's a, Jimmy's a little guy. He's 140 pounds, and he was just doing, like, he was just taking this guy down. And that guy was big. And, like, how how was he doing that? And he, how was he positioning himself? And they were asking Coach Steven about it. And Coach, Coach Steven was telling me, like, look, dude, you, like, like that's why I wanted you in here. Yeah, I mean Stevens a Stevens a much different uh, body type kind of guy than you. Yeah, you know, I mean people are like when when they see stuff work for Steven, like oh it's just because he's big. It's like no, Stevens super super <laughs> technical. Super technical. Like, but you know, you understand what I'm saying? It's it seems more impressive coming from someone who's who you can yeah. you can't say hey oh Jimmy was out muscling this guy and it's like no <laughs> Jimmy doesn't like this dude's got you know an extra Jimmy on him. You yeah. know? Like, yeah. <laughs> he, he's like weighs twice you know. But I mean. Because, I, I mean, I, I see that with some folks, and it's like, I don't think that's necessarily true. I mean, you know, with, you know, big, I, I've, I've seen some, like I said, I've seen Steven work, you know, I mean, it's a, but you know how perception is kind of like a, a, a king sometimes. I mean, yeah. you can, I mean, just, and that's one of the things that is always, you know, I mean, like like you said, you know, been good about the school, you know, here, you know, because I'm like, hey, you can come here, let a dude waste buck 40, throw you into the air if you want, you know, because <laughs> that means it works. That means like, hey, I mean, you, you can show p- people that, man, like, if you can get your technique right, you can make it work for your body You type. can, 100%. And, like, that's, that's what I was saying about my brown, and that was my comparison, is, like, after that, it was, it was like, after that, and Steven called me, and was, was laughing about it, and he was talking about it, and he was like, that's why I wanted you here. Dude, it, it finally sinking in, like, holy shit, like, I'm coaching at a tenth planet, like I'm I'm coaching here, and like I'm. It took me twice as long as it has everybody else, but I'm finally getting recognition. I'm finally making it. Right. I'm finally got somebody that says that's my dude, and uh, like feeling this feeling this way is kind of like yeah, you know. And I feel like for the first time in my entire life, I don't have anything to prove to anyone. Like, I, my whole life, I felt like I'm just climbing this uphill battle and I'm just carrying people on my back. I'm just, like, climbing this mountain and I'm trying to make people understand, like, I know what I'm talking about. I'm good at this. This is something I'm good at. And I'm trying to get that recognition and I'm trying to, to like, fight to, you know, get the respect that I, uh, that I, that I, I want. Mm-hmm. And in the sport and and all this, and now like the other day, I was just like, uh, when when Stephen called me and was telling me all that stuff, and he was like, dude, I, it, it finally was like, holy, like, dude, I'm a I'm a tenth planet coach, bro. <laughs> like it, I just started smiling, and now to see the growth that our school has, like I've been a head coach here, I, like I started this school uh, six years ago, and now. Uh, Six years later, I'm coaching at another school. We're building a whole nother thing, and uh, like there's a there's a a lot of other things in play and stuff. But I'm I, it, I now I feel like I can truly be me, mm-hmm. and I can like I've always worked hard. Anyway, I always will. I think I think that's just a part of who I am. But I also know that I weigh I walk around 138 pounds most of the time. I'm a little bigger right now. I'm proud of that too. I'm 147 pounds right now, but uh, I walk around 138 pounds usually, and I have to position myself a certain way. I have to move a certain way. I have to do these certain things because if I lay a certain way or if I let you get to a certain position, like 
there's a, almost no coming back from that. Mm-hmm. And I think that's part of what makes me a really, really good coach, So is that uh, I've been there. Too. Yeah, I've been there, and I know what I have to do. I know how to teach you to move so that this big, strong person can't just – move you or crush you you know yeah i I think i think it's definitely like an efficiency mindset you know um because i mean you literally have to be most efficient with what your body gives you you know and that's what matters more you know and i mean teaching that that's a universal tactic that doesn't that works for whatever size you are it works for however much muscle you have because i mean Let's just be honest. Like, if you're more efficient and you have more muscle, I mean, well, heck, you know, yeah. <laughs> like it just makes your muscle more efficient and better. So, I mean, there's there's a lot to be learned and gained from that, you know. And and like like you said, it just teaches teaches. A, I really find most of your tactics are, are are just all efficiency based. Like, hey, man, you know, you're just losing so much by like, and you've always been quick to tell somebody, it's like, hey, man, you're losing so much staying right there, or you're losing. You know, you're burning yourself out. So, like, that's not going to work on somebody who's bigger than you. You are never going to muscle that. Like, you might can muscle that on someone smaller. You'll never. And and jiu-jitsu is much more important, I think, about because if you teach yourself to, you know, fight above your weight limit, I mean, you know, that that's just not something that anybody else knows. That's why jiu-jitsu works, and it, and it is efficient. It lets you fight above your weight limit very, very far, you know. And, I mean, like you said, you're weigh 140 pounds, man. I mean, someone who weighs 300, they won't understand. Yeah, I mean, you know, like, <laughs> it, I mean, there's uh, letting someone who's 300 get a full sunk in side control is no fun for anybody. <laughs> like, you know, it's 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 awful stuff, you know. But like I said, it's definitely an efficiency mindset at the school, you know. And one of the first things, I mean, because you'll teach someone who's 300, it's like, man, listen, I don't care if you do weigh 300 pounds, you shouldn't do it that way. It does not matter because hey, guess what? Guess what? At three hundred pounds, you got to watch out for. You're gonna get tired real fast. So I mean, another three hundred pound guy, y'all. When you go to compete, like you're gonna be dealing with another three hundred pound guy. Guess what? You've never had to feel. You never had to feel somebody grab you like this and move you. <laughs> like, like you've never felt that. Yeah. Guess what? You're gonna feel when you go against another guy at three hundred pounds. He's going to grab you and he's going to move you. Like. It's just that simple. And, and, I mean, if you're less efficient, you're going to be the tired one. And, yep. and, and and one thing you've always been really – it's like, hey, man, if you're in a fight, you definitely want to be the person who's less tired. That's what set Steven apart at heavyweight, though, because he's always been at the bottom scale mm-hmm. of the heavyweight division. He's always been the, the, the smaller guy of the heavyweight division. He, w- he wasn't ever small enough to be out of the heavyweight division but he's never been big enough to be the big guy in the division and that's what sets him apart is that he's he understands like that gap and he understands like oh when somebody's 30 pounds is a lot like if you're giving up 30 pounds to somebody that's a lot dude and um like you said i'm 138 pounds if when i'm going against a 170 pound guy that freaking weight matters man Mm -hmm. is especially if your skill sets are comparable sure like if, if your if your skill set is comparable, right? Comparable, um, it's so much harder to to do something with somebody because of that thirty pounds. Especially if they're efficient with their energy, because that means their gas tank is going to be better. How many times could I bench one seventy or get one seventy framed and move compared to how many times you can move one hundred and thirty eight? Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> like that's it's crazy, you know. Like so. I said, it's, it's always about efficiency, though. Yeah. So, question. Sure. Uh, what's your favorite thing about the 10th Planet system so far? Um, let's see. Uh, at, and it, it, once again, I think, I think it's just sheerly the appetite for innovation in 10th Planet, period. I, the growth. I, I can't say that it's like, oh, it's like, I like one move, you know, because yeah. 10th Planet doesn't matter about that. It's like they love innovation. They're like, man, and, and it's such a meritocracy. You know, they're like, man, we just want to see results. We don't care. We, I mean, and that's refreshing to me, you know, because, me too. you know, some people would get like, hey, man, like you're tinkering with my system. I don't like that. You're making it seem like my system don't work. And that's a lot of ego. You know, it's a ton of ego when someone tries to say, I don't want you messing with my system. You are not allowed to mess with my system. But when you let a white belt make a move, I, I, don't, think, I don't think you have that much ego about your system. <laughs> because, you know what I'm saying? You're like, it, 
I don't care if he's a white belt. You know, he come in and showed me a good move. I'm, you know, because it, it really, I think one of the best things I've ever heard is, you know, if you listen, anybody in, anybody in your life can teach you something. And I think that that's almost like a 10th planet, an unofficial 10th planet motto. If you really like look past it, anything that anybody says, they really think that anybody can teach them anything. And I, what, what other school does that? Not very many at all, you know, especially any school that's like traditional, you know, but yeah. even non barring that it's like, like you said, once you've made a system, you're like, I think my system's the best. And if you tinker with it, you're insulting me. I don't get that from Zed Planet. No, that that's one, one of the main things I liked about it because our school, I traveled. I, I don't have anybody's system. Like everything that I do. Everything that we do at our school that everybody learned, like that I coach and taught here, come from 100, 200 different schools because for eight years of my life, I didn't have a home. I, or I had a home, but I, I, did, I was working on the road. So I was traveling. I'd, I'd go to this school for two weeks. Then I go to this school for two weeks. Then I go to that school for a month. Then I come to this school for two weeks. I was never just set still learning someone's system. So everything that I do, everything that my guys do, it's, it all come from, you know, you know, like all these different places. And I, I, that's what I like about 10th Planet is that, like, they'll say, oh, what do you do? Oh, man, that's cool. Here's what I do. And then you compare it. Like, oh, man, if we do this together, like, holy, wow, you know, whatever. I'm just making stuff up. But you, you get the point. Right. And that's what I love about it. And the fact that Steven found a home there. And I, Steven has a story similar to mine. It it makes me want to do it even more. Mm-hmm. So that's my that's my take on it too. And I ask everybody on the podcast. Uh, uh, number one, uh, have you ever used jujitsu in real life in a real world situation? <sighs> I, just to be honest, I think that like. I've been in much less of a position to have to use it since I've been, you know, like I've been in a lot less scary positions, you know, since I started, you know, training jujitsu. Um, because once again, it's like just the calmness of me handling a I, I feel like I, ha- I would say I use jujitsu in a different way. Like I use mental jujitsu, mental jujitsu and, and my, the mindset of jujitsu to keep myself out of trouble much much more than i would ever have to use the physical aspects not to, not to say that i don't feel like i i know it would work you know i mean i have the <laughs> confidence that you know i mean i'm not you know once again no, not trying to sound egotistical or anything but i know that like if i put some if i put 99 percent of the population in a weird position they're not gonna know what the heck's going on and it, it you know it's like i'm going to the back and it's going to be over you know i mean so, or, and I, you know, I know that if someone, some crazy person tackled me, I'm like, okay, we're on the ground. We're, this is where I live. You know, <laughs> this yeah. is where I eat, treat, eat, sleep, and train at. You know what I mean? All right. And to the other question that I ask everybody that come on the podcast, have you ever been in a fight? And if, if the answer is yes, what's your favorite one? And tell the story like, and make me and all the listeners feel like we're there. Can you do that? Uh, um, I don't think I've ever enjoyed any fight I've ever been in. Um, this is me personally, you know. Yeah, I'm not enjoy, but like you're, the one you enjoy telling, like the story, <laughs> like that, <laughs> like <laughs> Stephen. Stevens was like, uh, he this guy looked big. He had on a big shirt, and the guy looked big, and he'd been messing with his cousin or whatever, and Stephen just grabbed him. And slammed him, boom, and all the air left him. <laughs> like, it's hilarious because, like, that was the end of it or whatever. But, um, Like I said, for myself, uh, I mean, I, I grew up, like, you know, I, I grew up skinnier than you. You know what I mean? And, like, being of a much more timid uh, – I, I mean, I've never been before in my life, maybe before jiu-jitsu, never been a confident person. Never. Um, so I was actually always, you know, I was always picked on in school, you know, and I, I mean, most of my stories about fighting were me getting, getting beat up, you know, <laughs> like I got beat up in, in, uh, in gym one time. Uh, I don't even remember why this, you know, I think, you know, 
uh, I said something to one of my friends, and he was like, a dude was like mocking me. I said, "Hey, man, f you," you know. And then I didn't think nothing more about it. I go into the locker room. I guess he'd been waiting on me, so I went to get. I went to like uh, change my shorts. So I take my shorts down. He's like, "Hey, man, da da da." And I look up. I, my shorts down to my ankle. He hits me so hard, my head bounces off of the the concrete. While my shorts are still down, <laughs> I mean, all I did was uh, I hit him and gave him a black eye. So they they tr- they tr- they tried to suspend me too. But I'm like. Dude, what? I got beat up with my shorts down. You're going to suspend me just because he's the one with the black eye? I'm pretty sure I have a concussion. Like, my head was bouncing off the concrete like when he was hitting me. Uh, just because I managed to hit him in his eye, they're like, whoa, what did you do to him? I'm like, what? <laughs> like, he has almost 150 pounds on me. Why would I pick a fight with him? Like, he's obviously the bully. Like, what? How many times has he been in a fight? I asked the uh, the principal at the school. He's like, oh, uh, he's 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 been in a lot of fights. Like, how many have I been in? <laughs> well, I guess this is the first one. Hmm. <laughs> like, I wonder why. And it's like, thank God, everyone else, everyone else, you know. Of course, every other dude in the locker room was like, dude, that was the most hilarious thing. For so- and, like, no one gave him any respect. It's like, you beat a dude when his pants were around his ankle. Like, no one's like, oh, good job. And you still got a black eye that way? How? Like, his literal pants were around his ankles. And, like, you are you're the one with the black eye. So, you know, it ended up, not ended up I guess, working out for me, you know, because they're like, because everyone's like, dude, like, no respect for that guy at all. They're like, you know, because everyone just sees you being, you know, a, ju- a complete jackass, you know, <laughs> like, dude. So it's not a good story, but it's the one I have. You know? <laughs> like, it's like, uh, all my stories like that are just like, uh, you got a good story for that? Nope. I, I've got one, but it's not a good one. <laughs> That's the best story ever. <laughs> like, you know, how do you get hit with your pants? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because like I said, you know, I gotta, I gotta take my shorts off. I'm just like, not. I'm so oblivious to the situation. I'm, I'm not being in fights. I avoided fights. Like I said, I was a meek dude who got picked on, so I was like, definitely not gonna, not. I'm not seeing that this dude's over there like beefing himself up, you know, like it, he's over there getting jazzed up, you know. And I'm just walking, not thinking nothing, just go, oh, hey, go. You know, go to change out. I look up and wham! He just decks me and just bounces my head off the thing. I'm already like, you know, everything just goes. Beep. Yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, you're hearing like a, you know, this show has gone off air kind of sound. You yeah. know? <laughs> like, uh, there's like static and stuff going mm. on. And all I knew was like I just hit him back one time, and you know, I mean, me and him start trading. I'm like not even knowing what's going on, you know. But er- like I said, literally everyone who was in there was just laughing their ass off because my pants were around my ankles. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know? and, like, and I'm like, well, you know, whatever. I guess. <laughs> That's great. <sighs> All right, so um, I'm starting a streaming, a streaming thing. We was talking about that earlier, which is we went on a tangent about jujitsu. Go figure. Uh, yeah, of course. <laughs> it's kind of what this pod- podcast is about. Sure, sure. But um, anyway, so you guys might be able to see. Let's see if I can do this. Ding! Right there, I have a Go XLR, have a headset, and a microphone. So. I'm going to be Coach Jimmy underscore tech or underscore tech, not at tech, but T C T on that. I'm going to set up like a fake account that I'm not going to tell anybody to so I can practice like my overlays and stuff and figure out how it works because I'm retarded (laughs) and I don't know how uh, OBS works. Like, I know how to do it for this. Mm -hmm. I did all this stuff, most of it um, by myself. I had David kind of walk me through some stuff. Mm hmm. But other than that, I've been do- going at this all by myself. Uh, what do you, what do you think about streaming, and uh, what's your thoughts about it? You ever thought about trying to stream or anything like that? Um, me personally, uh, I just I'm, I'm not I've never had a want to be a streamer. Um, you know, uh, but I, I do actually like I watch a lot of streams. You know, I've always enjoyed. You know, streaming. I've always been. I've been an avid gamer. You know, most of my life. So when people, you know, I kind of got into the like watching streams like way earlier than a lot of people did. You know, I I mean, I I I remember. You know, it was the what was it, uh, Justin TV or something like that. Yeah, before before it was Twitch. Yeah. So I mean, you know, I've been watching for ever, man. You know, and uh, consuming a lot. I've consumed a lot of content and stuff like that. You know, but I've always seen that it's you know. It's hard. You know, people are like, oh, man, you just turn on the stream and play games. Like, 
Like, what have you been watching, man? Like, I mean, these people put a lot of time and effort into this thing, and it's it's a big skill to learn, you know. And I, you know, maybe it's just my path has never been that path. You know what I mean? I I looked at it and I'm like, you know, I I just didn't see it as being something that you know I wanted to take a path down. You know, Um, I'm not. I don't. Whether or not I'd be good at it, have a personality for it, couldn't tell you. Um, That's for somebody else to evaluate. Obviously, you know, that's for the people watching you to kind of evaluate. You know. What's your um, favorite thing about watching a streamer a lot? What What do you go to streams for? What do you want to see? Uh, you know, I always love a streamer who you know who has a really good rapport. You know, and I'm a I've always been a big fan of like self deprecating humor. You know what I mean? So somebody who can kind of you know make fun of themselves, not take themselves too seriously. I love streamers like that. You know, because you know some streamers get way too hyped up on themselves. You know, and and while that you know. There's an audience for that, obviously, because some of those streamers get huge numbers, you know. But I think some of the, you know, best streamers are the ones who, you know, you know, I mean, it's it's, excuse me, it's more than the game, um, you know, and it's it's always more than the game, you know. People's like, you, I've watched folks who are like the top zero 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 one percent of the gaming population at that game, you know, like they're the best in the world, and they've just had a terrible stream. It's awful. It's boring. They're just sitting there, just. You know, like a dead zombie, you know, just washed out. Just And if you look at the gameplay, literally you'll never see better gameplay ever. Like, it's, yeah. it's the best. Like, they're, <laughs> they're so good. It's crazy. But they're boring. Well, that's one thing you will not have to worry about with me because I suck. <laughs> I just enjoy playing. Sure. I mean, yeah, and, like, um, and I enjoy, you know, they, they always have good interactions with chat and stuff like that, you know. Um I, you know, not necessarily fighting with chat the whole time, but you know, and I'm not even a big chatter. Like I don't, I usually don't type. I'm one. I'm most of the Twitch population do, does not type. You know, it's just like Twitter. It's like, you know, 10% do like, you know, 90% of the typing. You know, but the rapport is always hilarious. You know, because I mean, you get trolls and stuff and stuff like that, but the rapport is always, you know, just just really funny. But you know, I, I love. But like I said, you know, a streamer can come on, you know, kind of make fun of themselves some. You know, that's always, you know, something I enjoy. So you enjoy the interaction uh, between the streamer and the viewer more so than the gameplay? Is that what you're saying? Um, yeah, it depends. But, you know, also, you know, th- just the way they handle the gameplay, you know, because, I mean, I, I, I hate somebody who's going to, like, if they lose and they just cry, like, oh, my God. It's like, you know, just they just rage. for And, like, some people enjoy the rage. And I'm just like, oh, my God, you're such a child, you know. like, yeah, And, it, and I get over it pretty me. quick, you know. But it's, if they lose and then they start just making fun of stuff, you know, like, that is hilarious to me, you know. Yeah. Like, you know, I mean, I, I mean, one person, you know, might get killed and it's like, yeah, well, I guess I'm just old and bald, too old and bald for this game. And I'm like, <laughs> hey, it's hilarious. Like, I got you, dude. Yeah. Like, I'm feeling that, you know, like, I, you know, it's that those are definitely, you know, the ones I will definitely tune back into, you know. Gotcha. Yeah, like, um, what I can't stand, we had a, we have a friend uh, growing up, and he'd be like, the game's cheating. The game's cheating. I'm like. Dude, the game is cheating. Like, are you serious right now? I shot you a thousand. Like, like, dude, you was looking at your feet. Like, or you was looking past me over here. Like, like we, we're all four sitting in the living room playing the same game. Like, we can all see your screen. Like, but he would, he would break his own remote. He broke my remote one time. Like, the game's cheating. I'm like, is, is that your remote? Like, you owe me a remote, stupid. But... He would cry. It was hilarious because he was so upset, and we would just dig more. But I don't think I would enjoy a stream where somebody would be mad or raging in a room by themselves. Well, there's a lot of people who watch for that, and they love just getting in there and trolling those folks, trying to make them upset. But the reason why I wouldn't try and be one of those streamers is because if you notice, they're always the first one to be like, I need to take a two-month break from streaming up mental. It's just nothing. It's just gone, you know. I mean, because guess what? I mean, you can get some view. I mean, it's, it's like a troll kind of like uh, – it's like a toxic kind of viewing situation, but some people love that. Some people are – 
you know, pretty sadistic, just being honest, you know. Yeah. They love seeing people in pain. Almost. I mean, you know, it is what it is. You know, that's just how some people, you know, they love making fun of the folks and trying to amp it up, you know. And I'm not saying, like, you know, like faking a little bit of, you know, like, oh, this is, you know, like kind of, you know, being a little over the top about it, you know, but you can kind of tell that they're faking. That's the difference between somebody who's like, like, I just broke my controller. Like, no, I'm wrong. Somebody's going to watch that. But, like, dude, you're not going to survive as that streamer. You're not gonna have a career I'm, in streaming. I, I can't. I can't do it. I'm not emotionally involved that much into into it. I hate losing because I'm competitive as hell. Yeah. Like, I don't like to lose. I think that's why I did fighting, and that's why I, I do. I love jujitsu so much. It's like I'm fr- I'm fucking competitive. Um, but I, I think I'm gonna. I think as far as streaming goes, I I enjoy playing, mm. and I enjoy talking. Sure. Like um, I think it's a perfect fit for me. Uh, for one, I ha- I do like life lessons, Coach Jimmy, right? Mm-hmm. I do life lessons with everybody. Uh, my family, I'm the guy that everybody, that everyone in my family, kind of leans on, you know. And I'm the one that kind of like holds everybody together, and always. And that's kind of like what I was saying earlier. It's like I'm I'm the one climbing the damn mountain, and I'm just like holding everything together, and I just got everybody on my back, and I'm just climbing. And, uh, like, I want to be at the top of this fucking mountain, regardless of, like, like whatever. And I want the people that I want with me when I get there. And that, and a lot of times that's toxic because sometimes some of those people don't need to be on top of that mountain with me. <laughs> they, I, I should have left, I should have kicked their ass off, off my wagon or whatever you want to call it way before then or now. And, but I, I think my stream's going to be interesting simply because... I'm not, I don't suck to the point that I'm not competitive, mm. but I'm not good enough to be like considered anywhere near the best in the world. But the chat and the talks and the mindset and the, the gear and things like that, the tech, setting things up, I'm doing it all myself. I'm asking for help, like pointers and stuff along the way, but I'm doing it all myself so I have real world experience so I can help other people and pave the way for other people that want to do it. So, um, and, and you know, I think, like, there's starting to be a lot more appetite for, you know, positive people on Twitch. Um, one of the, like, there's a really, really interesting guy that you, if you haven't watched him, I mean, I love this guy. His name's Dr. K. He's a Harvard-trained um, psychiatrist, right? You know, really, really, really smart guy, you know? But he streams on Twitch and just try. it's called Healthy Gamer GG. He's all about the trying to address the mental health problems that they have that, you know, is just endemic in, in the Twitch community. And, you know, there's a lot of people out there looking for help, man. There's a lot of people out there looking for somebody to give them a damn positive message. And people, are, people always want to say, oh, the community's just toxic. Well, I mean, what are you going to do about it? And someone like Dr. K is like, I'll show you what I'm going to do about it. I'm going to be out here and I'm going to be pulling, you know, 15,000 viewers on a, on a, on a, on an advice stream, you know, I'm going to pull, he's pulled some of the top streamers on there and, you know, kind of, you know, helped them out through their stuff and do the things that they're suffering through. And, you know, I think it does help show, you know, give some humanity to the streamers too, because I think people dehumanize them and, and also, you know, abuse them, you know, and, and just say whatever they want to, to them, you know, because, Oh, he's a millionaire. You know, it's like, that's still a person, dude. There's still a person on the other end of, of your abuse. You know, and I mean, so he, he tries to help people, you know, you know, be feel, you know, not dehumanize people online as much. You know, he teaches how people how to meditate, which once again, if you don't meditate, man, you, 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 need, you need to get on the bandwagon. You know, um, I'm, I'm one always to preach on meditation, you know, um, you know, I do it every morning and it's, you know, it's, it's one of the other things that's helped out a lot. You know, I mean, and, and people don't think that people have an appetite for that message. And he's out there crushing it, showing them, hey, man, people want to hear this. People don't want to be sick, dude. People want to be healthy and want to live a good life, you know. People don't want to be sick, man. And, you know, there's such an appetite out there. And I think that, like, the way you come off could be, like, if you really leaned into that, you know, like, lean it's like, this is, I'm making a community and you guys need, I'm pulling you guys to the top. 
come on, let's go. You know, if you want to get on and sub, if you want to get on and, and, and you want to be on the bandwagon, come on, guys, I'm pulling you with me. You know, I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you some things that are positive for your life, you know, and I'm going to show you how to deal with stuff in a positive way, you know. Um, and I think it's really something that you could build a good niche for, you know, and, and like I said, there's a huge appetite for it. Yeah, I, I think that that's what I was leaning towards anyway, mm. because uh, I already, like my first uh, group, or whatever is mostly going to be people that train mm -hmm. with me. And um, that's already what I do here. That's already, like, dude, I can't tell you how many times a day I get messages like, I don't know what to do, or, hey, man, I'm having a rough day, or whatever. And I'm just like, oh, you got this, you know. And, like, uh, that's who I am. I'm Coach Jimmy, you know. Um, and I've... In the last four years, I've really owned that. It's what I've always wanted to do since I was a kid is be a coach. Mm -hmm. And uh, I truly enjoy uh, coaching and doing uh, jiu-jitsu. But I, I, I've always leaned more towards life coach than jiu-jitsu coach, even in my kids' class, classes. Like, I'm teaching jiu-jitsu, but there's always a life lesson. Always, there's always a life lesson to the kids, like where focus goes, energy flows. Uh, you know, if you focus on the negative, you're going to get the negative. That's all you're going to see. Um, those type of lessons like, um, you know, I say yes, sir, and no, sir, to you. So you're going to say yes, sir, and no, sir, to me, you know, or I say yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am, to you. I've always, have you ever heard me call you or say anything else to you? No. Okay. So that's how you have to talk, you know, and I, I really believe in what I'm teaching and what I'm coaching, so. I think that that's where my stream is going to lean. It may change because I, I do get competitive and I do, I do get into it. And especially if my brother's on there with me, we talk, we talk shit back and forth, but not, we don't cuss at each other or be negative about it. Like one of my favorite things to do is he'll get on there with me and we play Rocket League. We're a team, him and me. We're, we're the same team and we're playing <laughs> Rocket League. But if something, he does something or if I do something that kind of sucks, I'll say teammates trash like, <laughs> like in the corner. And it's so funny because he's like, really, Bubba? They don't know that we're talking to one another. <laughs> they don't know that we're, we're real, like family or whatever. So they'll see that and they're like, oh, he's talking crap about his teammate. But I'm like, teammates trash. Mm -hmm. And Cody's like, Really? I mean, I, th I think, you know, uh, healthy ribbing, you know, I don't think I'm one <laughs> to kind of be like, hey, you know, we should only be, you should only ever say nice things to your friends because I'm not that guy. Bro, you're so mean. <laughs> like, you come in and just clown on me some days and I'm just like, I'm going to be mean to you. I'm going to say some stuff and you're going to be mad at me. <laughs> but it never works. I mean, I, I, you know, I think there's, you know, I've always been like, hey, man, you know, th there's a huge difference between healthy discourse, you know, between friends and, and you know, the way you talk to people online. Like, I, you know, because I'm like, I'm jabbing you because we're friends and I like you, you know. Right. And I know you can take it, too, because we're friends, you know. And I'm not <laughs> like, I'm not like going to like destroy, Bull like. Bullying me, making me go home cry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When does that happen? Come on. I'm being on. Yeah. Uh, don't okay hold on hold on I, you gave me a kind of look there but um you, you know i think you know good just random jibbing between friends is much different than the toxicity we see online because those are not folks we know and well, i i challenge you to find one instance of me online doing that um to folks i don't know you know what i mean i, re I really <laughs> yeah, to do. throw that in there to, to, to folks i don't know <laughs> yeah that's the point you know i mean it's it's much different when you have you know a, a rapport with somebody yeah i'm a lot meaner to people that i know oh, sure. oh, good God, yeah. you know i mean we we have a rapport that's built on that you know i mean that's something that me and you've always done you know i think people see us in the gym and do that and you know i think i mean they, i think it brings levity to the gym too though you know i mean yeah. i mean everyone is always cracking up about it so it's, i mean hey well they i think they i think the thing is is that they know that we're just we're friends and yeah. we're just we're, we're just, just 
Rodney chose not to whatever. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I couldn't imagine anybody thinking, you know, it's like, oh, Corey really thinks that about Jimmy. Like, God, Lee he hates Jimmy. Like, <laughs> what is going on? Like, like, why does he even train here? Like, he obviously doesn't like this dude. <laughs> you know, no one says that because, like, if, <laughs> if every rib I've ever given is with a smile, you know what I mean? <laughs> and I invite it back. You know, it's not like you, it's not like you're, you've, you've not said, you know, unpleasant things to me because it only feeds me. You know, it's, I'm expecting, if you didn't say it back, I would feel bad. I would be like, oh man, I really hurt his feelings. Like, I mean, I, I probably am not going to say that again. You know? <laughs> like if you just walked away and didn't say nothing, I would feel like garbage. I would, I would be the one going home and crying after saying something mean to you. I'd be like, oh dude, you're such a terrible person. Person. But then you give it right back, and I'm like, hey, hey, let's, you know. About six months, I'm just going to look at him and go. And just leave. Yeah. <laughs> and just leave. And I'm ruining wait. my entire I'm, week. You I'm going to wait but six no, months. But, but, no, I mean, I don't, I don't – once again, I think online, you know, I really do think in, you know, a streaming kind of atmosphere, you know, people would really enjoy that, you know. And, and I think your welcoming manner, you know, and the way you treat people is going to – um, and gender a community that's very positive, you know, dude, I'm look, I'm looking forward to it. I'm going to do a lot of, uh, YouTube videos, mm -hmm. uh, promoting it right before I start my first, like my first real day stream or whatever. I'm going to unbox like my, my $2,000 mic and which I, I don't, I didn't, I didn't pay nothing like that for any of that stuff, guys, but I'm going to be like, Oh, this is this mic and this is this other thing. And, like, I'm going to be opening and unboxing and comparing. I'm going to compare that really expensive mic to one of my podcaster mics. I'm going to plug them up. And sure. I'm going to have one here and one there and, like, compare the, the pod mic to this really expensive mic. And, and I'm going to say, okay, is this worth the money or is this not worth the money? I'm going to compare a DSLR to uh, the cameras that I prefer to use is I, I prefer these cameras over DSLRs. They're so much simpler. Like, they autofocus, which I usually turn off when I'm doing the YouTube videos because they constantly bring my face in and out of focus. But for podcasting, they're amazing. For right. streaming, they're amazing. I'm not going to be doing a lot of moving around. Like, we're right here. It's mm -hmm. not going to be doing a lot of focusing. So I'm going to, like, do the unboxing of the Go XLR. I'm going to do a walkthrough of how it works. And I'm going to post videos on YouTube of all of those things. And then I'm going to give away, uh, I don't know if you guys can see it or not, but it's right there behind, yeah, you can't see it. Uh, but it's right there behind Corey. Like, boom. That is a plywood uh, four-foot Nintendo controller built out of three-quarter inch plywood and painted and everything by David Rodriguez. He, like, he built it. He built all the buttons. And it's too spec. Like, if you took a controller and just put it on a large scale, it is the measurements and everything are identical. And I'm going to be uh, giving one of those away. Like, you know, that uh, the more you do, the more points you have, the more chance of winning you have. Stream points? Yes, yeah, like Gleam or something like that. Gleam IO or something like that. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm going to give one of those away, and one of the things is, is like, go like, uh, go follow my stream, follow my YouTube channel, you get points for both of those, uh, following my, uh, like, my uh, Spotify playlist, yep. following the Tech Center on Facebook, following uh, Tech Talk on Facebook, following Tech Talk on YouTube, uh, all of those things, like, you get points for those things, and then um, I'm going to use that. That's a $200 piece, mm -hmm. and I'm going to just give it to somebody in order to, you know, promote and grow. Yeah. And, some, man, that's going to be a phenomenal piece to have in somebody's game room. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> like, I love it. Yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to hang that one up in my stream room, and then while it's hanging, I'm going to be like, hey, I'm giving one of these away. Like, you have to do these things. And uh, it does date you a little bit because uh, I would have a, I would have had an SNES, you know, but you know I'm not I'm not an old man, so. Oh yeah, you would have <laughs> had a Super Nintendo that yeah. come out in like 1989. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I'm just, I'm just saying, you know, the NES is uh back in the 80s, you know, with you, you old folks, you know. Dude, that controller, that controller is awesome. Yeah, no, it's cool. Controller. Oh, you can see it behind you a little bit. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. That controller is awesome. I love it. 
Uh, I think it's one of the coolest things ever. It's like a retro gaming controller. So how are you going to do, like, um, incorporate jiu-jitsu and stuff in your stream? That's something I really wanted to ask you about. Um, dude, that's going to be uh, one of the things, like, we're going to talk about it, mm -hmm. and we're going to talk about it. And, <clears throat> like, in the stream, obviously, people are going to talk about the ways of learning. And I think that so many people get caught up. Uh, and I, I'm, I, I do it, too. Drill. You know, I tell people, drill, drill, you need to drill, you need to drill. But another thing I tell my guys, and I've been telling my guys for years, and you can attest to this, like you can testify to this. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not training your elbow. I'm not training your wrist. I'm not training your knee. I'm not training your ankle. I'm not training your foot. I'm training your mind. Like if you get hurt or injured and you can't train for whatever reason, you still got to show up to class because I'm not training your damn foot. I'm not, like, whatever you hurt. I'm not training your pinky finger or your pointer finger, whichever finger that is. I'm not training that. I'm training your mind. And you still learn stuff when you're watching. Mm -hmm. And I found when I hurt my back in 2012, I had the biggest jump in my uh, skill set ever. Like, I went from being... I'm not going to say trash because I was still way better than your average person, but I went from being an average blue belt level competitor to being a high level brown belt competitor in 2012. Overnight, like I hurt my back. I couldn't train anymore. I started watching other people training instead of just rolling and grinding. And that grind that I was watching people do uh, or that I was doing when I, I realized, like, well, there's more to grinding. Because you, if you're just grinding, you're just making the same bad habits over and over and over and over and over. But when you sit down and you watch and then you see something someone else is doing that it, they're finding a lot of success with, you can kind of go, oh, I see what they're doing there. And then you can kind of mimic it and figure out what they're doing and you've actually just taught yourself another way, and you didn't, you didn't do it. You just seen it, and you was like, oh, I might can do that. You still have to play around with it when you get healed or when you get to a chance to where you can. But by sitting and watching other people, I got better at jiu-jitsu. When I come back, I hadn't trained. I, I didn't train for six months. That's the longest stint since 2002 that I went without training. Six months. And it was when I had surgery on my back. And uh, when I come back, I was two times the competitor and two times a grappler that I was before that. And I had just been grinding before that, dude. So, like, um, that I would say, I would tell people, like, I would give them advice, obviously. I would let, you know how Chewy does those people ask questions? Yeah. Uh, I have, I'm going to do that in my stream. I do like that. Um, I think the main thing that people uh – the main trouble they have with like garnering a new move or something is because I'll watch the roles, you know, after class every time. And, you know, people always like you, it's so, it's almost like it's, it's comforting to use your same, your same go to, your same go to, your same go to. But if, if I've learned anything from only with you, it's like, hey man, like you literally have to try it when, when the role and like if it fails, it fails. Like it's it's okay to be in a bad position and tap. Try it again. Why did it fail? Like because I mean you know there's there's so many things. Like I mean how many times have you taught me a move and like I'm gonna try it on you afterwards? You knew I you knew you just showed it to me. I'm gonna try it anyways. Like yeah. I'm, I'm expecting it to fail. I'm a hundred percent expecting that not to work. And if it worked the first time after you showed it to me, I'm, I'm I probably I'm not I don't I don't I don't think I've ever had that happen. It's it's like I like you said I have to get it into the get into the room and tinker with it you know um but i mean I, I think people get a little too afraid to try stuff you know dude uh it's funny you said that right now like my arm i don't know if you guys can see that like right here is bruised right now doug <clears throat> arm barred me because i was trying a new arm bar escape it's not new okay first of all let's get that out there it's not a new arm bar escape there's nothing new about it it was different than what my traditional escape is, something mm -hmm. that I use. I've been using the, the same two escapes probably for 10 years, and they, they, they're my bread and butter. 
right. they work. And I, uh, usually I'm like, don't get there. But I uh, learned a new way. Like, I seen it, and it, it goes against everything that, that you're taught early on. And I was like, I'm going to try this escape. Because it goes against everything that you were ever taught. You're going the opposite way. You're not hitchhiking out. You're not mm-hmm. moving. It goes against everything you're taught. And I'm like, I'm going to do this. No, <laughs> didn't work. <laughs> like, like I felt myself. I was escaping. I was escaping. I was, I was going and going. And then it, it said, uh, and it stopped. And then I wasn't escaping anymore. My arm popped. <laughs> and, and I was like, ooh, yeah, probably shouldn't have let him stretch me out that much. Mm-hmm. So I tapped. And it's because I was trying something new. Yeah. And uh, I tapped. And then two minutes later, I'm rolling with uh, this guy. And he pulled my arm into my own knee so hard that it left a bruise on the inside of my elbow. <laughs> it hurts to grab stuff. <laughs> it literally hurts. But uh, I didn't tap anybody out that day. Not one person did I tap. But every single person I rolled with onboard me. <laughs> And mounted guillotine me <laughs> because I was trying two escapes, except for except for that guy. He uh he tried to rear naked choke me. Tried. Did did you rear naked choke me? Yes. I I, I don't know. Maybe I went to sleep. I don't. Yeah. I'm just kidding. Taps don't matter, right? Yeah, taps don't matter. Taps don't he matter. Uh, he rear naked choked me. Uh, which everybody rear naked choked me mm-hmm. too, because I I was literally I was actually trying. To get you to attack the arm because usually you can't finish the the back and you'll switch off to my arm because I was wanting to try my arm bar escape and then I was trying because uh, Troy does this mounted guillotine it's just like the one I do where you roll forward and you mm-hmm. roll back he does one where he just steps across straight to mounted guillotine mm-hmm. and I was trying to use the electric plug with the lockdown. Mm-hmm. To defeat the uh, mount of guillotine, and he's so long and lanky, it did not work. <laughs> he just got past it. No, yeah, he just choked me anyway. So I had a rough day. Like everybody I roll with, um, I was trying to bait you to armbar me, but because I was trying to get you to switch off like you normally do, you finished the freaking choke, and then I'm like, um. Uh, Troy, I let him get me there and couldn't get, <laughs> couldn't get back out. I was stuck. So uh, it was a rough day. It was, it was just a rough day. But sure. that's what I love about jiu-jitsu. And I try to tell people, like, nobody's going home keeping count. Like, I don't have a tally board in my home, like, how many times I tapped out Corey. It was like, it was like one. No. Like, there, there's no, nobody is keeping count. Some people might go home and say, yeah, I tapped him out. But it lasts like a day, dude, and then it's over. Nobody remembers that crap. Um, the only thing that matters is, like, your growth, your personal journey. Are you getting better? If you're not getting better, you're training wrong. Mm-hmm. Like, and that's the stuff that I'm going to bring to my stream. Yeah. Basically, is like, don't be scared to fucking tap, bro. Like, I went through an entire class. I have my A game. There ain't a person in our gym that can put me on my back. If I don't want to get put on my back, if I don't, if I don't want you to get put on my back, there's not a person in our gym that can put me on my back. And that sounds arrogant or cocky or, or, or you know, it does. It does sound that way. But there's just not anybody in our gym. There's, there's just not anybody in our gym that can put me on my back if I didn't want to be there. Nope. And, uh, <clears throat> but I, I played on my back the whole day, which is making my guys get better at guard passing. It's making my guys better at finishing, you know. So, like, I want you guys to get better. When you guys tap me out, dude, it makes me feel great because I taught you, you know, like, <laughs> like, I showed like, you that. <laughs> I showed you that. Like, man, you did really good. Like, you even added your twist or your flavor on it, you know, mm-hmm. like, you, you are bringing something to the gym and you're doing it. And sometimes my guys, I'll show them something that I don't really do because I'm not built that way. And I'll show them something that I don't really do, but I understand how it works. Right. And some of my guys will take that shit and make it their own, and then they're doing it all the time. And then when by the time I see them doing it again later, I'm like, what are you doing? And it's 
some it's like some weird Frankenstein thing off of what I taught them. Sure. And it's better. Innovation. Yeah, and I love it, dude. Like that. I I love it. I come in this I come in this place and I, I drill and I roll. Like, I rolled with everybody and just got beat up. <laughs> My arm hurts. <laughs> My neck hurts. And uh, I went home and Taylor was like, man, you know, you had a rough night. I was like, yeah, but did you see what everybody was doing? Like, I know that if my guys get there to that position, they're finishing. Mm. It made me feel so good. Right. But anyway, I, I think that's what I'm going to bring to the stream is we're going to – people who are going to – white belts are going to be able to ask me questions about how do I get better. Yeah. Blue belts are going to say, hey, I keep having this one guy do this. What do I do? And I'm going to be able to go, go like, okay, you're doing something, and like, I'm going to talk them through that. I think it's going to be great. So uh, something else I think might would be interesting. Uh, like I don't know if you know anything about like stream points and stuff like that. But I don't, uh, not yet. So uh, when people watch you, they get uh, stream points that accumulate, right? And then you can like cash them in for stuff. So I mean, you might get to a point where you're like, hey man, you know, you cash in. I don't know how much is a lot, you know, because. Uh, I mean, I never keep track of it, but, you know, because not everybody really utilizes it that well. But it's like, hey, if you cash in 10,000 stream points, you know, you can send me some of your roll footage and I'll, get, I'll send you back some commentary on it. Oh, that would be, yeah. You know what I mean? Like stuff that, like that. That would like, be awesome. Because like, like we can't really like offer a private to people that might be out of a dang state. But like, hey, be like, hey, send me in some footage and I'll, and I'll throw a commentary on that footage. Dude, today, today, um, I had one of my students, um, I, I call them my students, they're, they're Brent Coleman students too, like, they train with Brent, mm -hmm. but they're sending me their footage asking me to uh, break down and see what they need, what yeah. I think that, like, they're messing up or where they need to grow or, like, what do you think I, where do you think I messed up or what do you think I did really good, mm -hmm. like, because the, that group, you got uh, Kara, Courtney, Kyle, Doug, um, you got you got a nice little solid group that's driving an hour and thirty minutes to come train with us once a week, and they can't get over here a lot, so they'll send me footage from their roles at their gym, and want me to do a breakdown, right. or work with them like why why couldn't I finish or whatever. I mean, I think I, it, hiccups. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's I think I think it would be a definitely interesting thing, you know. Um, because I, I think there's an appetite for stuff like that, you know. Or, I mean, you know, I, I, I'm just shooting. I'm just throwing Dude, stuff against I'm the I'm excited wall. about that. Like, I think, I think that that is going to be what sets us apart. Sure. And, um, like, another thing that I'm doing that I haven't really spoke a lot about, but uh, I'm going to take, uh, like, back here behind me, I have this TV. Mm -hmm. It's hooked to the security cameras. Mm -hmm. My security cameras are 4K. Mm -hmm. I'm going to bring up the feed and put it on my Twitch stream. So at night when we roll, like all of our rolls are going to be clips on Twitch. And you'll get to watch footage of my guys rolling at the end of the night. And then uh, the kids' classes, I'm going to put, I'm going to stream, live stream straight to Twitch. Parents. Those cameras, those uh, to those cameras to the parents because right now because of COVID, parents aren't allowed in the in the gym. Right. So that's going to be my way of streaming. I got thirty something kids on average mm -hmm. in each class. I'm going to stream. Well, lately, it's been more like twenty, but I'm going to stream the kids' class to my Twitch, and like let people watch the classes and kind of take what we're given there. Obviously to get really good at it, you got to feel it sure. and, and do it. But that's free content that people can, if they just subscribe to my, um, or, or if they just, uh, follow. follow, follow my Twitch, they will get, uh, they will get the lessons, mm -hmm. uh, right there watching my Twitch live. And, um, I, I'm I'm not exactly sure how all of it will, but I do know that the middle camera where we circle up at in front of, I'm going to have every single lesson that I ever do right in front of that camera, and I'm going to uh, edit those into an online profile that people can subscribe to and pay a monthly fee to uh, get all of those lessons yeah. too. A ton of content. Yep. So there will be a ton of content from our school 
from our wrestling classes, our self-defense classes, our Brazilian jiu-jitsu class, and our, you know, even our bullyproof programs. So, but I, I'm doing all of that stuff, and I'm, I'm getting to a point to where I'm really, I really do need to hire an editor, a full-time editor, and I'm getting to a point to where I know what I'm doing is going to generate uh, income. Oh, sure. I just got to buckle down and, and grind and do what we were talking about doing earlier. So, but um, anyway, dude, um, what what are you looking at? Are you looking to compete in the future? Or are you? Uh, I know you competed before and stuff, and you're really dominant when you did compete. So, like, what what are you looking to do? What are your future plans? For jujitsu. Period. Oh, um, well, uh, yeah, I'm just. Put him on the spot. Boom. Uh, I definitely do want to compete again. I got a little bit of a risk, get fully back uh, to where. That was a nasty break. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I had a pretty severe, you know, break in my, uh, I broke the, really, really broke my wrist. But, you know, and according to the doctor, I probably shouldn't even be rolling now. But, you know, it is what it is. Um, <laughs> Jiu-jitsu. Uh, well, you know, um, I, I'm only doing things where I'm, I'll be confident in, you know, um, and until I'm confident in all my grips and uh, being able to wrestle again, you know, because um, that's going to be probably the, bi- the big point, the big next jump is like getting more confident enough to where I'm ready to wrestle again. And because there's some things, man, like uh, like I can't even like because, you know, I'm right hand dominant. So I'd always go to this hand for like, you know. Any of my guillotines, you know, high elbow, anything like that, I'm always grabbing my left hand. Can't do that. That side pressure is just too much still at this point, and that's why I don't – my guillotine game probably just fell off. I uh, just pretty much just use it as a headlock now. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I know what you mean. You know, I'm, I, So I have to start figuring those out better, you know, and, and probably actually using my left hand as the as – the, the pulling. The puller, because pulling with it seems fine. But, you know, um, but I would like to compete again. You know, I'd like to compete again before I got out of blue, you know, because uh, I wouldn't want to skip any of that, you know, because blue is like a really good level to compete at, you know, because you can get a lot of like your competition experience at blue. I noticed that you um, you're sticking to the higher level belts too, like you're rolling with Bam Bam, you're rolling with me. I haven't. I brought with some new guys again, but yeah. did you? Yeah, I did uh, last night. The the um, I don't remember his name. The the, the bigger new guy. Mm. The bigger new guy. I'm trying to remember, he was rolling with Mel first. Either way, last night. But yeah, I mean. Um, oh, Evan. Yeah, okay. Evan. Yeah, Evan. But yeah, okay. Yeah, I was gonna say I I, I noticed you were sticking with like me and and. Um, yeah, but I mean, uh, oh, I, bam, bam. I, you know, I did roll with Adam and stuff too, you know. Did you roll with Adam? Mm-hmm. That's brave. That's brave. That dude, let me tell you what that dude did to me. First of all, I want to, I want to look at this camera right here. Cause I gotta, I hope he listens to this <laughs> podcast. That dude is not right. Right now he's 330 pounds. Right now he's 330. He come in here. He's like 368, 365. That dude literally tried to pancake me. Like, I was in his guard, or he was in my guard, and his way of breaking the guard was to dive over me. Like, flat dive over me. I was like, you mother... Like, not not it, fun to be there. Like, obviously that's a technique that would work for somebody that's 365 pounds. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> but... <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> Probably pretty consistently. But, <laughs> like, but to like, be honest. like, come on, dude. I'm 138 pounds. <laughs> like, how many is that of me? You could also kill me while yeah. doing <laughs> Like, <laughs> I might die. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, that's three jimmies. That's three jimmies. But, uh, yeah, I think I ended up, like, coming out the side and taking his back. Hopefully. <laughs> or something. But, like, I'm, the, I, I'm like, dude, you were literally three jimmies. Yeah. Like, come on, man. Like, but, have you ever seen the meme? It's like, uh, it's like, uh, what is it? It's like the German guy or whatever. It's like, if he is weak, he will die. <laughs> if he is weak, he will die. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just uh, no, no concern for human life at all. Yeah. But, 
Um, <laughs> but no, I mean, uh, when, he, when he dropped the weight too, I mean, he started moving surprisingly well. And when a big dude starts moving well, yeah, he's it, athletic, bro. Yeah, it gets scary. You're like, oh no, <laughs> <laughs> the only advantage I have was being able to move, and now he can move. Oh god, <laughs> he's athletic, bro. Yeah, yeah. Like, and, uh, when when you see a big dude who's athletic, you're like. Stuff just got serious. <laughs> it just got real serious up in here. Like he started running a half guard game. I'm like, uh oh, uh, this is not good. <laughs> like, this is not good for me. Big guy with bottom game. This is this is terrifying, <laughs> like, dude. Uh, you know who I miss, Lewis. Lewis. Lewis was like, like three hundred, three twelve, something like that. It's like five ten. And he moved. He was just as fast as I am. <laughs> that terrifying. dude was dangerous. I miss that dude. He uh he come in here. He learned like a uh, a drag arm drag to an arm bar, arm drag to a back take to a, a, a arm bar. Like two days later, he's like, dude, I got to show you this tape from work because he is an officer. <laughs> he's a cop. <laughs> he's like, I got to show you this this footage. I'm like, what is it? You got a 312-pound man arm dragging a 250-pound man, throwing him in a horn bar, like live, real-life situation. And then he's like, hey, calm down <laughs> if you want to keep this. <laughs> Look, I mean, I think, I think more cops would benefit from that. You know? oh, I've, I've always said that. You know, it's need like, a belly. Need a belly. Just like period. need a belly. Period. Oh, I do have a bone to pick with you on that. Like, so, uh, like, my marriage was fine. <laughs> and, and, Hold and, on. How do we start this like, off? Let's, let's, my marriage was fine. And then suddenly Jimmy teaches my wife how to do a proper neon belly. <laughs> and now, now I can't get nothing done at the house no more. And like, I can't act like, you know, I'm the man of the house anymore because. <laughs> She'll put the neutron star <laughs> into my chest, and I'll I'll be down there like uh, <laughs> like I, I'm not I do not let her get to neon belly like I will give anything else up in the world because <laughs> she had a private with Jimmy one time and then come back and now is a pro at neon belly. <laughs> uh, you can ask Jimmy; it's not a fun place to be. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. The neutron star. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> she sent me a meme one time that said. Uh, that you know, it's it had weights and stuff like that. You know, it was a diagram, and the end diagram was like a was a black hole, but it was replaced with it was like it was like neutron star black hole is like my coach's neon belly. <laughs> like, but, she, but she scratched it out and was like her neon belly. I'm like, yeah, that is that is a hundred percent true. So anytime we come in here and like she's my she's my training partner. You know, always going to be my drilling partner. Um, which hey man, if you if. If you want to have your marriage get better, you know, try and, I mean, train to choke each other. It kind of works out all of the kinks, you know, like you don't, <laughs> you don't like fuss about stuff too much anymore. Cause you're like, you know, once you get all the, the, the aggression out choking each other and it's like, okay, that's, we're cool now. We don't have to argue. It's all good. You know, we'll settle it in the, in the Thunderdome. You know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, Corey's like, there's a regime change at my house. <laughs> <It's over. laughs> like, I got put in my place by that neon belly. It's over with, dude. <laughs> like, you know, Corey's like, but can she wrestle though? Can she wrestle? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm just kidding. Nah, man. I I love having couples in here. I love having you guys in here. You guys, like, when you guys, when she, like, right before she had the kid and stuff and. Like, I was worried about, like, are they coming back? I knew y'all was coming back. Just but took time. Yeah. But still, you, ne you never really, you never really know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was like, oh, I don't know. And you guys have been a mainstay here at Tech. And, like, part of the reason I experienced most of, the, like, a, the start of the growth with her reaching out to people and setting appointments. And doing that, like, we got rid of some toxic negativity inside the gym. And I was, I was too busy trying to fix stuff instead of just saying, you know what? Out. Get out. But when we done that, the culture changed to what I've always tried to get it to be. And once it, once it got there, there was so much growth. And it was because of you guys, like, coming in and... And really promoting and her really reaching out. And that growth, like, it never stopped. It never slowed down. So, like, I'm forever grateful for that because you guys really did. You really guys are really are part of 
you know, y'all embody what takes about here, you know, family training with each other and, and everything. Yeah, we uh, it's, it's, there's a cool Facebook uh, profile if you haven't followed. It's uh, called the Cauliflower Ear Family. They're, <laughs> yeah. they're, they have like eight kids and they all train together with them. It's, it's awesome. Like you know, I, th- I think I think it's a great thing for family to do together because my my kids are excited to come to jujitsu. I mean, you can ask uh, Jimmy. Like the first thing my girls do, they come in is they they run to Jimmy and hug Jimmy because they love they love this place. You know, I mean. Just ask him, you know. I mean, they're they're always super jazzed to see him. You know what I mean, dude. My favorite thing <laughs> on earth, it, my favorite thing, is uh, your your baby. I call her me <laughs> because when I ask her her she's name, she's not the baby anymore. Well, yeah, she's not the baby anymore. <laughs> oh man, <sighs> she's the baby. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> he's the man of the house. <laughs> <laughs> very true, very true. <laughs> he, he's going he's gonna to teach you how to mechanic one day. <laughs> Facts. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Lennox was like telling Bam Bam, my name is Lennox. I'm not me. Shit, and, but, but I've always called her me because when, I, when she was a baby, I said, what's your name? And she'll go, me. <laughs> me. So I'm like, okay, from, forever you're going to be known as me, okay? And she's like, okay, I'm me. Well, she, well, you guys come back, and I was calling her me. And then Coach Bam Bam was calling her me. And then Miss Taylor was calling her me. And she looked at Taylor and Coach Bam Bam, and she said, my name is Lennox. It's not me. Understand? <laughs> and they was like, yes, ma'am, we understand. And then they both come to me, because that was a Wednesday night. They both come to me and was like, you can't call her me anymore. Her name is Lennox. And I was like, she's me to me. I don't care what she says. And she was standing in my class, and I was like, hey, me. And she said, hey, Coach Jimmy. <laughs> Coach Bam Bam said, you ain't going to tell him like you told me? I said, what's your name? She said, me. <laughs> <laughs> it's just different, you know? <laughs> I was winning. Like, that's the greatest thing in the world. And Taylor and Coach Bam Bam are still salty. <laughs> they're, they're like, oh, really? He gets special privileges? He, he gets to call you me? I mean, but, you know, I mean, you got to think in a lot of ways. Like, my kids are growing up here, man. <laughs> they spend a lot of – we spend a lot of time here. You know, we've spent a lot of time here. You know, and, I mean, I just – I like – I like my kids better when they come here consistently. I mean, you know, I, I don't think that's messed up to say, you know. Like, I don't either. They're, they're, I they're understand. cool people, you know. I mean, and, like, when they're – they have so much better attitudes and, you know, they interact with me different and they interact with my – you know, all, we always have something to talk about, you know. Like, there's no bridge and a gap, you know, because, I mean, I think some families have a lot of gaps in between them, you know. There's, like – you just come home, you come get on your computer, your wife's on her computer, the kids are on their tablets, like everybody's in their own little bubble. We go somewhere and we all sweat and grind together. You know what I mean? Like, so, I mean, we talk and we interact in, in a lot better ways, you know. I mean, we have healthier relationships in, in between each other so much better, you know. And, I mean, I'm just going to tell you, like, if people worry about their girls and stuff like that. Like, <laughs> you you have fun being a, being a little shithead boy who wants to mess with my girls like uh you better come with it because like i said you know most people worry about you know it's like oh man you know i'm gonna go down to the the police station you know and pick her up because something bad happened because some terrible boy did something to her and it's like i'm gonna have to go down to the police station and be like she broke his arm i'm like where was his arm at uh, if it was in a if it was in a wrong place, I think I'm okay with her breaking it. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, I mean, and, and you know, I just don't feel like I have to worry about them. They're gonna be tough kids. They're gonna be well. They're gonna have friends. I mean, you know, they're gonna have what consistency. Feels, yeah, and feel like they have an extended family that loves them. I mean, I don't. I don't think. I think as a parent, having more people in your life who love your kids is never a bad thing. Because you know, we've all we're all so once again back to the isolation thing. You know, all so isolated. But it takes a village, man. Dude, let me say, um, like having having that village and having those those other people, and then it, it reinforces everything you're trying to teach them. But also, our kids compete every single Friday. Like tough. There, most jujitsu schools, what they do, and this is this is from experience. 
they teach a class, they teach a move. Most of them don't get into the life lessons or the values like I do. Most of them, not most jujitsu schools, do not do a 15 minute segment of life lessons. I do it every single class, or Coach Bam Bam does it, depending on who's teaching the class. But we do the 15 minute life lesson, the life values, life lesson. We give them a word of the day, we teach them their move. Most schools come in, drill a move, let them roll. They come in, learn a move, you let them roll. My school does not do that. We drill them. We come in. We teach. We do the life lessons. We we do the warm ups. We do the life lessons. We get into the move of the day. They drill the move of the day as their live roll. Like it's live drills. It's like okay, if we're learning a takedown, there one person's actively stopping it. The other person's trying to do it. Then you change. Then you change. But Friday comes around. It's a competition. We have brackets. We have weight classes. We have whatever, and every kid that's enrolled in this school competes, and it's battle-tested. Like, they are going to be able to do and control and do what they're, learn- what they're learning because we battle-test it. It's not just like at the end of class they roll. No. Friday comes around, they're off in their own little, like, category, and they are competing, and they, get- they win a belt. Like, every Friday they win that belt. And, like, our, like, like you were saying, your girls are, man, you're going to have to be a badass dude <laughs> to be able to, you're going to have to be a badass dude to be able to put up with that. Because cause your, your girls will be able to whip their ass, like, for sure. You know what I'm saying? I'm not too upset about that. You know what I mean? Because, I mean, I'm not always going to be there, but the stuff we've taught them is always going to be there. You yeah, know, you can't always be there to protect your kids, man. The things that are always there for your kids are the things that you've taught them. The the, the, the it's always going to be there with them because I mean, you know, I mean, some of us never had that stuff, you know, and that's why it's so important to me, you know. And I mean, I, I hammer on it so much, you know, because you know, I mean, there was gaps in my family life coming up, man, and I'm not, I'm not willing to see that in my kids, you know what I mean? Um, and, and you know, I'm, I, my kids are not going to grow up knowing they don't have my support, you know. But, I mean, I'm not saying I'm going to – and they also know dad doesn't put up with much, you know, and, and then dad is going to push you to do things that are hard in your life. He's going to – and when you do something that's hard, it doesn't matter if you fail. I'm always in your corner because I'm so proud of you doing something hard. I'm so proud that you tried your best. I mean, it just fills me with just – because she told me later, you know, you know what she told me later? She said, you know, I was feeling bad about it. And then I looked over, and then you and Mama were just, you guys look so proud. And I just said, tough it up, Lily. And I was like, oh, whoo, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, man. That's- I hit with the chills, you know what I mean? Because, like, that hit me hard because, like, you know, that's always going to be there with her, man. Uh, we were all proud of her for that <laughs> role, dude. Like, like, that role, that was a... Like, you don't see those types of roles at the highest of the high level, like, dude. Like, that like, was a technical, and it was a battle, scramble. dude. It was like 90% scramble. Yeah, <laughs> like, that was a battle. Yeah, and you know, and like I said, just for her to go afterwards and go, you know, I, I, I was going to get upset about it, and then I looked at you guys, and, you know, you guys were so proud, you know. And because I know we were. We were all just like, you know, just beaming at her, you know. It's like it doesn't matter. And, you know, we do that to all the kids, you know. When we see a kid getting through a tough role, you'll notice all the coaches hit to them, like, hey, man, you know, we're so proud of you. Like, you gave it something in that one. And, like, you left something on the mat in that one. And, like, whew. You know, I mean, it, it, it's it's inspiring. You know, you, you get inspired by kids class in here. You know what I mean? Because you see a kid, and, you know, that's just something I just want any parent who's, you know, I mean, just be proud of your kids when they do this stuff, man, because it's hard. You know, it's really hard. It's so hard. <laughs> we, we actually had that happen. Um, we, we have it happen regularly, but recently we had a, a lady that was just dragging and grinding on her kid like, you're not even trying. If you don't start trying, I'm, I'm not bringing you back. And she's like, you're just getting out there and you're just flopping around and you're just, you're not even trying to get up. And, and I was like, he is. Like, so he is. He is trying so hard. You should be so proud of him. Like, he is, he's trying. This is just hard. He's not even paying attention. And I, if you think he's trying, then 
obviously you don't know what effort is and like i'm like listen like i, I com- i'm a competitor <laughs> like i've been competing since i was six years old i'm a i know what effort is and i know how hard this is you don't understand how hard this is so you you just don't understand like how much he's trying and you're you are breaking this kid like you are tearing this kid down and you're you're probably he's probably not going to try because he is trying right now and you're then you're not proud of him and uh I'm like I tell you what I want you to do you come come here on Monday and bring some uh bring some gym shorts and some uh some clothes and I'm going to let you roll with a couple of the white belts here I'm I'm just going to let you you know I'm going to teach you an armbar and a triangle and I'm going to that's what we're doing on Monday it's just an armbar and a triangle. And then I'm going to let you roll. And I, I just want you to see, like, w- what I'm talking about. Because I think you need to, before you start trying to pull your kid out, you need to understand, like, what's going on here. Because, like, anybody can look at a TV screen and go, oh, I can do that. Anybody can look at a UFC fight and go, oh, well, he just needs to throw his leg over here. Oh, why does he, why does he keep stepping out to the left like that? All he's got to do is move forward. Like, anybody can look at that and say, this is all they got to do. Mm. But then when you actually have to do that, you got to be the one that pulls the trigger, that runs in that fire. You got to be the one that, like, gets in there and times this move right. Or you got to exert this energy and or move to get this person off the top of you or upa and shrimp and do all these things simultaneously and think about like what's happening to you and trying to stop it it's hard and it's overwhelming and it it takes practice it takes showing up Mm -hmm. and uh this parent got on the mat she actually showed up and got on the mat we still had other parents that still do this and I'm, i'm i have to go hey chill out Mm -hmm. but um this parent showed up barely made it through the warm-ups then she uh did the arm bar and she set out for the triangle part because she was so tired Mm -hmm. she did one a three minute round with taylor and no moss just started crying and she run over to her kid like I'm talking about run, like, run over to her and just hug him, crying, bawling eyes out. I'm so sorry for saying you're not trying. I will never, ever, ever say that again. Oh, my God. Like, you, like, this is what you've been feeling. This is how it felt. Like, <laughs> oh, my God. I'm so sorry. Like, just bawling. And it was like, it made me almost want to tell parents, like, if you're going to sign your kid up, you got to come here on a Saturday and train with us. Let's try. Just one, one day, one Saturday, so you can understand, like, how hard this shit is. So you, you don't break your kid, like, or discourage your kid when they're trying to do this stuff, you know? So, I mean, there's just an important lesson there. And it's like, you know, in trying to push your kid into success, you might make them scared of failure. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, they gotta feel. They feel like they gotta be perfect, and, and that's unattainable. It's not real, and it's going to make it's going to stunt them because you have to tell your kid, man, it is okay to fail at this. You know, it's okay to choose hard because, like, that teaches them not to be afraid of hard things because there's so many hard things in life, man. Literally, everything that is worth doing in life is hard, and you will avoid every single one of them if you're if you're terrified of failure. And you you don't have to be perfect. Just get started. <laughs> Just, just get it. started and do it. And like, you're going to fail. Failure is part of the formula for success. That's one of my life lessons for the kids. And then, like I said, you know, you, you can crush that out of a kid. Easy. Like, you can crush that out of a kid. And, you know, another thing, I mean, people don't think about, you know, and I experienced this growing up, is like, if, if your kid is smart, don't tell them. Because guess what's going to happen? It's the opposite thing that you think of. Because a smart kid's never going to do anything that makes them feel stupid. You know Why? Because they think they're a smart kid. So anything that's hard and that makes them feel stupid, they're going to avoid. I did it. I did too. <laughs> because they, you know, I, I had good grades growing up. I was in gifted classes and stuff. And I started avoiding things. And when I started running into the first thing that was like, shit, I can't figure that out in five seconds. I avoided it. Yep. I remember the first thing it was. It was, it was a calculus class. And, you know, I 
I had straight A's in literally every math class I ever took. And when I, when I started running into that thing being hard, and I'm like, I gave up. I, I dropped out of the class. That's crazy. To have literal A's in every single math growing up, and then as soon as math got hard, I was like, ah, bye. And then that's because I was afraid of, I was afraid afraid of failure. Of, afraid of failure, man. And then, you know, I started to realize, especially with jiu-jitsu, man, it's like, cool, you failed. Good. What's, ne- what's next? Dude, I, um, I was the same way. Like, I got praised for being smart. Like, I loved science, and I loved, like, I took apart this uh, – truck and built like a flashlight that you could squeeze and it would light up and everybody praised me for it like oh he's so smart look what he did and look what he built and you know mm-hmm. and um like i i took a part of a uh, remote control truck and then built a flashlight that you could turn on and off with uh, the controller and um uh, the, con- the truck still worked but i also had a separate flashlight because i had two pieces anyway point was is that everybody, my family was talking about how smart I was and how gifted I was. And then uh, the moment, like Taekwondo, Mm -hmm. I took to it. Fighting, I was really good at fighting. It's the only thing I ever been really good at. But other sports, I would quit. Mm -hmm. Like football, I didn't understand the plays. Still don't. I played football. The only thing I was good at was getting lower under somebody and getting to their hips. Like a wrestler. So, like, I would get in this four-point stance. Nobody was getting past me. Mm-hmm. And I was small. And they're like, you're too little to be a lineman. But you're not good enough to play any other <laughs> position. <laughs> so Can't run the play. Yeah. Because I, I just couldn't. So you quit. Couldn't figure it out. And I quit. Mm-hmm. And um, I tell everybody, like, oh, I quit because Coach Peacock made me run. He followed me in a golf cart. You going to run until I get tired? Because I was late every day. Mm-hmm. I was late because I had one of those teachers that didn't care about football. And wouldn't let me leave early like everybody on that first bell that everybody else got to leave on. Mm-hmm. So I was always the last one on the field. He made me run and do belly slides until he was tired, but he's riding on a golf cart. Yeah. Yeah. And I told everybody that was the reason I quit. That wasn't the real reason I quit. The real reason I quit is because it made me feel stupid mm-hmm. because I, I, couldn't, uh, I couldn't play any other position. I couldn't do it because I didn't understand enough about what I was supposed to be doing. Right. To figure it out. And nobody took the time to say, this is where you go. This is what you do. This is what we need you to do. You know what I mean? But you put me on a line in a four-point stance, nobody can. The person in front of me is not clearing me. I'm going to hit them so hard and so low and come up so fast. Like, yeah, like I, was, I didn't know any fear because I was a fighter. Right. But anyway, so I understand the mindset. Yeah. I, I felt the need to be smart. I felt the need to be perfect. I felt that I was so scared of letting people down that praised me. I was so scared of, of just looking stupid. Yeah. You and don't identify with it. You've, you've made a different identity for yourself. You've made the identi- identity that I'm a smart person. And smart people can't feel stupid. Right. Like that's an identity problem. So, like, I think it's more important to praise your kids for their effort rather than, like, 100%. just saying, hey, you're smart. It's like, hey – what you did at school shows that you worked so hard. And that makes me so proud to see you just give it your all. And, like, it looked like that stuff was hard for you, but you kept at it. And, you know, because, like, I tell Lily that all the time because she's, she's a math whiz. I mean, she just crushes math and science. She doesn't like to read that much. But she, when she works at it and gets better at reading, then she gets better at the other stuff. So I tell her, hey, you know, you're struggling with it. That's good. That means that later on you're going to probably read better than most people because you're going to have to struggle at it. You don't think of that, but, like, most people who have to struggle at stuff end up being way better at it, you know, because they realized, hey, man, it's okay to not do the best at it every single time. Dude, you see it in the gym all the time. You see guys that are freak athletes. Yeah that are so good, they come in and you're like, if they stick with this, they're going to be unstoppable. They're going to be monsters. They are going to be the next world champion. Like, you see these guys come in and you're like, they can go somewhere. Mm -hmm. But all of those guys are mentally weak because everything comes so easy to those guys. I have yet to see a person that come in here in my school that is a high-level like high level athlete that 
like when they come through the door, they they I'm trying to word this where I'm not I don't sound like I'm just bashing somebody, but the usually the ones that come in that are just so friggin' athletic that pick up really, really easy, they don't stick with it because after it's not easy anymore, once it starts getting hard, they quit. They quit. Because they're not used to things being hard. Because they're great athletes. Yeah, we've had so many people. I've, I can think of three people off the top of my head that if they had the mental fortitude or the mental uh, toughness. Just crush everybody. Yeah, that, that we would already have. We would already have two guys like on their, well on their way to be like UFC champions or, uh, you know, Abu Dhabi champs or whatever you want. I could think of three guys. Off the top of my head, that if they could get their shit together mentally, they. But it's it's three things, and you you. It's so rare to find all three. One of it is mental toughness, right? Another one's money, like yeah. somebody that can afford to go off and do these fights, that can go off and get the training, that can pay the training that they need, mm-hmm. right? And then another one's a skill set. Because you do so, have to have Yeah, talent. the physicality. Like, it's so hard to find somebody with all three of those attributes that can act, that, that actually have the time to, to do it. Because if a person don't have a lot of money, they don't have the time because they're spending working it trying to make money. Right. And then if you got the person that has the time and the skill or the talent, then their mentalness isn't there. The mental toughness that they need usually isn't there because they've never had to struggle. Those guys that are just fucking phenomenal, like they, that, like these college football players, just a prime example, we have them come through here a lot. And uh, they, they haven't had to work hard for, for that because they've always been physical. They just, like, obviously they've had to work hard to be on that yeah. level playing football, but they haven't had to work hard like this. In this style, they've never had someone hold them down and make them feel helpless where they couldn't move and they couldn't get back up and and all that. So it's a, just a different mentalness that comes, a mental toughness that comes with trying to be a fighter, you know, or, or a grappler. Uh, grappling just grit, man. Is there so much grit in grappling that it's crazy? Um, I think it's really enjoyable, though. I think that's one of my favorite things about it. Is the is the <clears throat> is the is the friction that you get in grappling? You know what I mean? Because like that's kind of which what it is. You know, the I mean, ups and downs. It's an it's awesome feeling. Like I really enjoy that a lot. I mean, I enjoy you know just coming in and just getting ragdolled sometimes because you're like sometimes you'll pick up the most you've ever picked up off of getting getting crushed because you're like man you know like what was going on there and you start being you're way more introspective about those kind of roles you know. So I mean, once again, it's just like. You know, I'll tap any time. You know, if you can get to a spot to make me tap, I don't care. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not ego tripping out here at all because I know that I'm gonna think about this for a minute afterwards. You know, because your failures drive you way more than your successes do, and you know that's just something true in life. You know, like every failure that you've ever had pushes you farther than any success ever will. Failure's part of the success the formula. Yeah. It's part of the formula. It will. For success. I, you will think so much more on that and how you can make that not happen again <laughs> than, than you ever will think about like how you got to a successful point I'll sometimes. Tell you a story. Um, uh, this is my second grappling tournament I ever went to. Um, I was, I was grappling with a guy and, uh, took him down, but he, he like pulled guard. So I didn't get my points. It was weird. Like it was one of those things. Like I'm taking you down, but you can you're you're basically jumping guard to avoid points. Top strategy. Yeah, strategy. Running the wheels. And uh, I've never grappled that way because I'm an MMA fighter. Mm-hmm. I started MMA. I didn't respect BJJ tournaments like a competitor. Now I do. Mm-hmm. Back then I was just ignorant to it. But um, so. I got there, and in my mind, like, we're going to compete. We're going we're gonna to see who the better grappler is. And I go to take this guy down, and he, like, jumps guard. And I get to half guard, and I'm sitting there, and he can butterfly sweep me. So I'm basing out. And I'm like, I'm not going to let him sweep me. Three minutes go by in this match. Nothing happens. I'm just stuck. 
in his half guard. And I wasn't skilled enough to pass his half guard. But it, I was skilled enough to stop him from sweeping me. So we were just stuck for three minutes. Nothing happening. He lift me, I base out. I try to pass. He lift me, I base out. Finally, there was a minute left, and I decided. I made a decision in my head. I'm, like, I'm going to let him sweep me. I'm going to let him have this three points so that we can make something happen, so we can roll, so I can see who's the better grappler. I let the guy sweep me. I let him. I, we, we went over. I got him to guard, almost triangled him. He bails. Like, he explodes. He got his three points, bailed, stood up, and then run from me. I blast doubled him out of the, out of the thing because it was 10 seconds left. No points. Just blast doubled. I got two points uh-huh. uh, when I blast doubled him because mm-hmm. I settled, but we was way off the map. Like, I run him into the audience and settled. I mean, they gave me two points for the takedown. It's two to three. That was the score. He won. Two to three. I didn't play the game to win. I was playing the game to be grittier, to, to see who was better. But that, that failure, like I let him sweep me, wasn't what I learned that day. I took that match to that guy, the next thing, because that was our gi match. So then we went to our no gi match, and I had to compete against the same guy. Mm-hmm. And I was already frustrated because I ju- the guy just beat me. I went to take him down. He basically put his foot in my chest and rolled back. I forget what the throw was called, but he threw me. And I turned in the air, put me in a triangle. I was not stuck. I could have escaped. Could have got out. I've been in way worse triangles that I've escaped. But I was still upset because he run from me in the last match. I was still mad, and I was still, I took that last match into this match, and I was sitting there stuck in this triangle. I was stuck there, and uh, I thought to myself, fuck this. Like, I want out. So I sat there for maybe 10 more seconds, and I just sat there. I was like, he don't have it. He's a bitch. Like, in my mind, I was having this conversation, and then I tapped. I quit. Mm-hmm. No one knows. No one knew that I quit. And I've t- I think I've told this story on this podcast before. Same story. But no one knew that I quit. I knew I quit. That is the only combat thing in my entire life that I quit. Uh, my last MMA fight, I went out there. I didn't even want to fight until he hit me. <laughs> <laughs> then I wanted to fight. But I never quit. I've never quit anything to do with combat. But I mentally quit in that match. And I never want to feel that way again. So I took that lesson with me. And now I'm one of the, the most dangerous people to compete against. Because... I will not quit. Like, I remember how bad I felt. I didn't feel bad about the first match. That's fine. Like, the first match didn't bother me. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I should have played the game a little more. Mm -hmm. The second match where I got so emotionally charged and so emotionally upset. That you quit. That I quit. Haunts you. It haunts me. I still think about that. (laughs) And that that was like 2014, 2013. (laughs) I still think about this match. And it's... Because I quit. And um, it's funny, nobody else would ever known that I quit. But I know I quit. That's all that matters. Yeah, I know that I wasn't in any trouble at all. It was like one of those triangles where he was directly in front of me and my arm was perfect. I could just post. Like, there's nothing he could have done to finish that. He could have burned himself out to finish that. And um, he would have had to do a lot of work to get me off base or off balance to finish that. He could have finished it, but it would have been a lot of work. But I was just like, nah, he run from me the first time. Now he's sitting here with a little smug-ass look. Like, <laughs> and I quit. And I gave it. 
my victory away or gave him a, I gave him the victory. Right. Not my victory, but I just gave it to him. I'm like, yeah. And I regret it. And it taught me a lesson. That loss taught me a lesson like I don't ever want to feel this way again, so I will not quit again. Like I don't want to feel that way. It every one of my matches from a kid up, I always left it all on the mat. I always gave it my all, win or lose, I never felt bad about it. That time when I physically, mentally just quit, I felt like the worst person on earth. <laughs> like I felt like I felt like I didn't deserve the belt I was wearing, you know? And uh I learned that about myself. Like I won't ever do this again. And that's learn I learned that from failure anyway. Right. Like I, I allowed myself to to do that. You know? So it's, it's just crazy. Jiu Jitsu's taught me a lot too about life. Oh, and for sure. I, I can't quit. I can't I'm I'm not a quitter in that aspect. I'm a quitter if something's not working. I quit and try to figure out another way. But I'm not a quitter when it comes to like, oh, this is hard or this is tough or yeah. I'm in a bad situation, you know? Just figure out a way to get out of it. Yeah, man. Well, uh, we've been going at it for two, two hours. hours now. Uh, it was a, a great podcast. Um, dude, I love I love watching uh, Dana Her. I love watching Tom DeBlas, Gordon Ryan. Uh, now I'm getting into the 10th Planet stuff. I'm, I've been following Gio and Richie and uh, – I've been following, I've been looking back at some of Steven's uh, competitions. Yep. I've been following a lot of Eddie's stuff. Been following Ed, a lot of Eddie's philosophies as far as uh, training. Not, not <laughs> a, a, a thing, but. The look into it. Yeah, that's great, though. I, that's what I love about it, though, is that it's so open. And, yeah. And um, I'm, we're just growing under this system, and I. I Thankfully for Steven, I got I get a chance to kind of showcase where I'm at. And um, that's something else that jiu-jitsu's done for me. Before I, before I let kill this, I wanted to say this. Because um, uh, the first two years I was open, I haven't ever told anyone this. This is like a come-to-Jesus moment for Jimmy. First two years I was open, I was scared to advertise. Like... I was scared of the judgment that I was going to receive from the people that I trained with because there's a lot of people out there better than me. Mm. And uh, I didn't advertise my school, didn't promote my school because I was scared that people were going to talk shit. I was scared that people were going to judge me. I was scared that people was going to say, oh, he's not legit. I was scared people. I've been training a really, really long time. And there's still a lot of people still today that are better than me. Sure. That are a lot better than me. And I was scared that people were going to say, oh, he don't deserve to be a coach, this and that. Because I put the guys that I trained with on a pedestal. Mm -hmm. And then I had friends that were with me that were also negative, that was also tearing me down. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't realize that right away. I didn't realize that that's what was happening, you know? And I didn't realize that's what was making me so self-conscious about advertising and promoting. And this is my moment of vulnerability. Like, I'm letting people into my mind and know what I was really thinking and what I was going. Like, what, was go what I was going through and what I was feeling. I had guys that were supposed to be my friends, that were supposed to be Team Jimmy, tearing me down mentally. They would always uh, make me second guess my technique they would always say things like oh well you know let's let's go over here to bubby's or let's go over here to this place or they would take my guys and say yeah jimmy's really good but this guy's better let's go over here and that would tear me down and that wasn't completely their fault that was also my fault and my insecurities with my own uh self my self-worth and my my grappling you know and my, hum my my humility like me being humble i do put these guys that i train with on a pedestal and i do lift them up because they're good and they deserve it but um i didn't feel like i was on that level with them and it 
made me not want to advertise. It made me not want to. I didn't want to put a video out of me grappling or put a video out of me coaching because I was scared of the judgment that was going to come from the people that I trained with on a regular, consistent basis. And I was so insecure and I felt so, uh, like, I felt so, like, attacked all the time. Like, I had something to prove this whole time. And <clears throat> I, I was in my own shell about what I was doing here at my school. Even though I've always felt like I was a re- I'm a really good coach. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's the, the arrogant side of me is, like, I feel like I can break things down and teach things way better than other than, than others not better than like comparatively to other people but I have a way of doing it that is effective that's effective yeah that gets through and I feel really good about my coaching style like I feel like I make it and put it into uh terms that people can really relate to and they can catch it better but I still wasn't confident with letting the world see what I was doing and what we were doing differently until I seen my guys showing up at these competitions and like placing first, placing second. And like they were, they were true competitors against these other schools. And it kind of slowly built my confidence up. And then I'm, I've still, been self-conscious but then I cut that negativity out of my life that toxicness and then I just said you know what fuck it I don't care what anybody's gonna say I don't care what they think I don't care how good they think my skill level is I'm doing something here that's changing people's lives I'm doing something here that they're not brave enough to do themselves so they can talk shit all they want but I'm the one that's putting it out here on the line. I'm the one that's putting in this energy and this effort into these people's lives. And they deserve the same from me. Like, like they're doing it for me. They deserve the same from me. Like, my guys, you know? So I went and competed. And then I, I went and competed again. And then I started posting videos saying, come train with us. And then I started promoting. And then I, like, hired Beth. And then I, like, I just... I cut all that crap out of my, and quit worrying about what people were saying. The moment I let go and got the like tunnel vision towards my goal, you know, the moment I let go and said, fuck it, I don't care what these people say or think. I don't care if they like me. The moment I did that, the school grew crazy, like crazy. And then I had people talking crap. Like, I did, and I know I did. Sure. And uh, I had I had haters all of a sudden, but it didn't bother me. And and now I'm training with Steven, and these other guys are cross training with these other guys, you know. And I'm training with these other people, and then people are seeing how good I I've gotten or how good I am, and I'm getting to see how good I am compared to where they are because I used to train all the time with these people, with these guys. And then I got away from it and stuff because again, man, it's hard to fight yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, it's hard to, to face yourself when you're not sure when you're, you're not confident in, um, I've always been confident in what I'm teaching. Mm -hmm. Don't get that twisted. Right. I'm confident. I wasn't confident with, being able to say, this is why I'm teaching what I'm teaching, how I'm teaching, the way I'm teaching, mm-hmm. when there's other coaches that say, don't do this or don't do that. This way is better. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Anyway, now that I'm coaching for Steven and Steven's like reinforcing, like, dude, you're good. Dude, you're like, you are, you're really good. And he's reinforcing, he's building me up. I'm around someone that's building me up mm-hmm. and boosting me up. I feel more confident to try stuff and not not even be more worried about uh, tapping. Mm-hmm. You know, like I don't, which I never have been in my school, but outside of my school, like I would I would just roll outside of my school at other schools uh, 
And I would just go to like, I'm doing this. I'm not, I don't want to get put myself in danger. Like, because I don't want people talking bad about me. Look like I'm not legit. Yeah, I don't, like I'm not legit. And now I don't care anymore. And now that I've got to that level, it's free. Mm-hmm. And it's thanks to Steven believing in me and spending like a little bit of energy to build me up mentally. And I cut out the negative people. Mm-hmm. I faced those demons and started advertising. I put my chest up, even not being as confident as or worrying about what my old coaches or what other people were going to say. I was ready for that, that hate from people. And uh, now, looking back, it was silly. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, hindsight. L- like, looking back. So that would be my message and my, my story to everyone, and that's why I wanted to say that at the end of this, is, number one, do what you want to do. Don't worry about what people are saying. Don't worry about what people's judgment's going to be. Because here's the thing. No matter how good you are, you're going to get hate. No matter what, you're, what it is that you're doing, people are going to talk. And if you let that stop you from doing what you want to do, then you're never going to do anything worth doing. And it took me seeing some of my guys compete and do well, and it took me just being consistent to finally build it up enough courage to just say, fuck it, and go do it. It took that, and it was hard, guys. It was really hard for me to do it It was because I felt the need to be perfect My whole life, with everything that I do, I feel the need to be perfect. That's why my podcast is so big. It's why my stream is so, like, I could have done this with a lot less stuff. I could have done it with, but I have have to be perfect. (laughs) Even though I know I'll never be perfect, I feel that need to, to just go all out. Go all in, do it to the best of my ability. And that's how I am with everything. That's how I am with my coaching. And I think that's why my school grows is because I give every single person on my mat my all. And I'm passionate about it. But now here we are, and I realize how silly all of it was been, how it has been. Just do it. The right people will find you. The right people will find your circle, and they will boost you up. They will lift you. You will grow. You will become what it is that you want to become if you just jump, if you just go do it and do it. Like, set your mind to task. It's not going to be easy. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. What I'm saying is, is that you can do it. And that if you just be consistent, you will succeed. It just takes consistency. It takes time. And put yourself around the right people, people that are trying to lift you up and boost you up. If you're around I can't catch a break guy or around a dick that's just being toxic or around your friend that tells you, oh, I would do it this way or just a judgmental asshole. If you're around those people and you put value in their words, it's going to hold you back longer. I would be where I'm at now a lot faster if I just quit listening to all those people and cut them out of my life earlier. And that's what I want to say. Anyway, thank you guys. That was Tech Talk. This is Corey Webb. Later, guys. Jimmy Barnett. Thank you guys so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of Tech Talk. It's streaming, jujitsu, life, life values. Peace.